Hello, everybody. Hey. How are we doing? Garfield had. Hi, Steve. Okay, it's six o'clock. Call the meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's June 16th, 2021 revised order extending remote participation by all members in any meeting of a public body. This meeting of the Great Barrington Select Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and our parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Pursuant to MGL 7C 30A 20F, after notifying the chair of a public body, any person, may make a video or audio recording of an open session of a meeting of a public body, or may transmit the meeting through any medium. At the beginning of the meeting, the chair shall inform other attendees of any such recordings. 
This meeting is being recorded by this town, by CTSB, by the Berkshire Edge, Berkshire Eagle, and other members of the public. And any member of the public wishing to speak at the meeting must receive permission of the chair. The listing of agenda items are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may fact be discussed and other items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. We start with approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? Um, I was not here June 14th, so can we separate that one out, please? Of course. Uh, I make a motion to approve the minutes of June 14th. Second. So motion by Lee, second by Ed, any discussion? Roll, all votes are roll call. Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Yes. And I, it's four to zero, one recused. Continue, please. I make a motion to approve the minutes of June 21st, June 28th, and July 12th. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Yeah. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Select board's announcements, statements, Garfield? Uh, nothing at the moment. Thank you. Eric? Uh, no, thank you. Ed? Lee? Yes, I'd like to make a, a short statement about the discussion on short-term rentals. Um, and I, I'll keep it brief because I know there's a lot of uh, issues that we need to cover tonight, but I, I wanted to just refocus, you know, wh why we're actually discussing this and how this came about. Um, you know, there's a greater issue uh, of, of what it is to be a, a part of a community. And I just want to kind of refocus um, on what it means to be community and where we think that we want to be in, in years down the road. Um, and it, it's, it's very easy to kind of get lost in the minutia of, of days and limits and why uh, we're doing what we're doing. But I, I just want to you know, remind people that we're really in it together. And, um, you know, just to keep our eyes on the prize, so to speak, you know, keep keep our eyes on the future and, and try to bring everyone we can along with us. And um, sometimes we're going to have to give and sometimes we, we listen and we compromise. But I just would hate for this to polarize the community and polarize this board. So um, I just, you know, want to just refocus on the bigger picture. And, you know, as we continue these discussions and the media covers it, I, I just want to remind everyone that um, we are a community and, you know, we, we need to look at how these decisions will impact our future. And um, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I have nothing. So uh, town manager's report. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to go ahead and promote Chris before I get started. Uh, so first on my list for this evening is Houstonic Waterworks update, and I don't have uh, a lot to provide in the way of updates tonight, but as of today, we have not received a copy of the notice of non-compliance from DEP for exceeding uh, the haloacetic acid limits that we discussed at our last meeting. Four new documents uh, have been posted to our Houstonic Waterworks info tab on the select board page of our website related to that subject though. And you can always check that, uh, that tab at any point in between meetings for, uh, for updates. That's where they'll land when we get them. And then moving on to Houstonic School RFP and marketing. Uh, Chris and I just wanted to take an opportunity to update the board and the public on our efforts to promote the RFP. Uh, so I wanted to just mention a few things and, and Chris, feel free to chime in at any point, but uh, Chris has worked with our uh, BRPC, I'm sorry, uh, to create a video and that will be released as early as tomorrow uh, on our website. And it will also be sent out to uh, potential developers and used in any advertising that we do from here forward. We've posted the RFP on our website and on our social media platforms. Uh, we're also uh, in the process right now of doing some targeted ads in uh, the Boston and New York metropolitan areas. Chris is working on an email to send out to all the developers that we've heard from that have expressed an interest over the past several weeks, months, or, or years. 
And uh, Chris, I, I think you also have, if I'm not wrong, uh, an email in the works or an email blast with some Berkshire County organizations such as One Berkshire or Chambers, uh, any, anyone else I'm leaving out? We'll make sure all the real estate brokers and the MLS have at least the invitation. Um, BRPC has a list, I think, of folks that they work with, with as well. And of course, that can get out to a statewide list as well. So we're trying to put it out as far and wide as we can. Yeah, we're also getting some pricing right now on print advertising, also in the Boston and New York metro areas. So we have a pretty, uh, pretty good uh, list of uh, ways in which we're getting this RFP out there. And LMR, uh, who works with us on PR, is also helping us to uh, cast a wide net here. So that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Moving ahead, um, continued from January 24th, a short-term rental bylaw. My hope this evening as we go about a half hour with this, that we make some progress. We make this less of a debate and more just stating our opinion that maybe we get to vote on some key points and move ahead. And once those votes are, are cast, let's just move on and that part is closed. So Chris and I have talked and Chris is gonna lead us through this hopefully. And one of the things we, do need to decide is whether this is a general bylaw or zoning and uh, bylaw. And Chris, can you just go over the, uh, that topic? Well, so far as as has drafted and based on most of the samples that we've used, this this takes the form of a general bylaw. Um, and uh, that's where where a council would think that this, this type of a bylaw would fit in. It's including, uh, first of all, it's regulating uh, in terms of the authority that the general law of the state allows the town to do. And it includes things like registration. And those are the council's opinion, clearly uh, material for a general bylaw. It does not regulate in terms of what can happen in what zoning districts and what parts of town that would obviously be a, a zoning bylaw. So just based on most of what we've looked at so far, based on the planning board's recommendation and what they've drafted, um, what's in front of you would take the form of a general bylaw. Any questions? Um, yeah, um, it, to me, it seems like we went the other way, which is we went out of our way to make sure this was a general bylaw and not having had this discussion. I actually, I think, wasn't, didn't the planning board, the prohibition on having corporate events, um, they added in residential zones. I don't know if that made it to the final version. I know they discussed that. And I was gonna have um, several of the problems I have with this as proposed is that we treat the whole town as one, as opposed to like, there's a whole, there's a difference to have uh, short-term rentals in a business district or in an industrial district. Um, and in a residential zone. So I guess I would, I would hold that until the end, but I, I, unless our goal is to make sure this remains a general bylaw, um, I don't think that's a decision we've made yet. Um, if that is a goal, then those suggestions of mine are moot because it would make it a zoning bylaw. Lee? Um, I'd like to call for a vote, please. Um, on whether this can be a general bylaw. I'd like to make a motion that we vote that this is a general bylaw. We can't do that until we know what's in it. This is the first step we need to d determine, Ed. No, we, we, Ed is right on this one. We do, if, if we include zoning items in it, then it's gonna become a zoning bylaw. Now we may not wanna do that. And I, I'm not in favor of doing that, but we can state what our intent may be, but we can't, it's gonna to be town council. It's gonna to end up deciding whether this is a general bylaw or zoning bylaw. If we wanna state our intent, we can do that. I mean, well, is, the, is the reason you want it to be a zone? Well, I should just ask, what is the reason you want it to be a general bylaw rather than a zoning? 
Uh, I don't. I, what I no, not you, Lee, Lee, but yeah. Because it it it, rep it talks about the entire town. It, it's a general ordinance. So we're not spot zoning, Ed. We're we're including registration. It's something that's not regulated currently. Um, it, it's something that affects the entire town. It, it's not by zone. It's not by residential district or business district. It's been written as a general bylaw. It's it is in a general bylaw form. And we need to have that um, discussed and decided upon before we move forward. That's why I'm calling for the vote. Okay, so some of the things in here are, are to regulate how it impacts the neighborhood. That would clearly be different in an industrial neighborhood versus a residential. So if you're saying that's that we're not going to do that, then some of those things would have to come out of here. Well, that's yeah. what you, I'd like hold, to hold it. Hold it, Chris. Can you comment on that? Because I don't think that's what we've been told. No, and, can I please give you a specific example? Yeah, I guess I would ask first. I mean, the, the, this probably is not occurring much in industrial zones or in B2 zones or in the B district, downtown business district. It's generally in residences, which generally, not exclusively, are in residential zones. Go ahead, Ed. sorry. Yeah, well, if, if, well, the MXD, for example, like we're asking people to shield their trash containers, which I have a problem in any zone, but you know, that makes more sense in one zone than another zone. So if you're, if we're doing this for the whole town, why would we put that in there? Unless our intent, which is what I suspect, our intent is to make this a general bylaw because it has a lower threshold to pass a town meeting. So we're going to go out of our way to make sure it stays a general bylaw instead of writing a bylaw that makes sense and treating different zones differently like we do with everything else. So you're, think, you're, you're, so you're what you think the intent is, is totally wrong from my point of view. Both Chris and through Chris David have said the way it's written, all the ones that we have are general bylaws. And if you, if there's, so the content will matter. If right. Ed wants to regulate, for example, I'm not saying he does, screening of trash areas differently in some zones than others, then we're in zoning. If you don't care about trash screening, take it out. But we right. haven't had these discussions yet. Okay, that's why I'm saying we should wait till we have them. I, well, I disagree. I think that this is this is going to drive the discussion. And up until this point, it's been general. So I'll I'll I'll, rever I'll turn the mirror onto you, Ed, and ask you if it's been uh, talked about and discussed up to this point as a general bylaw. Why are you trying to to make it into a zoning bylaw once right. after the planning board has already given it back to us and recommending a general bylaw, and our town council has confirmed it's a general bylaw. So why are you at the last minute switching it back to a zoning bylaw? We, as it's written, it can be a general bylaw. So so what do you, why are you throwing roadblocks in right now? What What yeah. is your purpose for doing this? I'd like to know that myself. What um, is your purpose, Ed? If, if, may I answer the question? Yeah, if we, it, the last, at our last meeting towards the end of the meeting was the first time it was mentioned that this was going to be done as a general bylaw. Um, yours didn't say it, the planning board one we never got to, we still haven't talked about the planning board's version. Um, it was said it would be a general bylaw. And that's when I asked the question, is that a decision that's been made? We have not gone through the specifics of this to talk about, uh, except um, I, I did mention meetings um, at the last meeting, that's when it came up. I said, if we're gonna ban corporate meetings, why are we banning them in a business district? And that's when it was said, I was told, because we're trying to make this a general bylaw, and that's when I asked the question, is that a decision we've made? So there's a lot here we haven't discussed. And if we're, set, if we're saying this has to be a general bylaw, it, it, it'll make the discussion go one way. Um, there are things we'll have to take out of here because they're not the same in all zones. Um, that, that's not true because both Chris and David said there's nothing that we have to take out of here if this is a general bylaw. No, no there, are, there are, I guess, objections that I, I have there are things in here we treat the same in all districts that I don't think of it ought to be treated the same in all districts because their the districts are different. Um, that we, we really get into the minutiae of what people can do with their homes here. Uh, sometimes it might make sense in a residential district where houses are close together in a way it doesn't make sense in a district where houses are far apart or where there's uh, dentist offices across the street or where there are you know, law offices and things like that. Uh, Ed, do you have any plans other than to question, question, question? Do you have an idea of what you'd like to see, what you yeah. want done, how you want this written, as yeah. opposed to, you, I would like to see you say, let's do this, or let's do, or how about instead of, well, this, this, and you're criticizing, you're not really making a point other than objectives. 
And I would we, like for you to hone in on what you think you want, what you think this needs. If it's a general bylaw, let's get to it, but let's not pitch, 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 and not have any solutions. I'm sorry, I thought that's what we're doing at this meeting. I'm ready to go. Well, I don't think that's not what you're doing. That's what I'm feeling. That's okay, not what Okay, so I have, a, I have, and I'll, I'll just make it really straight. So Ed, if you do have specific um, issues regarding some of the, the points, why don't we just address those, you know, make a decision that we're going to go with the intention of a general bylaw and then address them. And if if our council says that it could trigger um, it as a zoning bylaw, then we'll we'll take it out. So why don't we just, you know, get some kind of consensus that it is a general bylaw. That's the direction we've been we've been moving. And if there are issues that you're correct on, we'll address them. So why what's the reason with that? Why can't we go in that direction? I'll tell you again because I think that's backwards. I think what we're saying is we wanna treat everything the same and then we're gonna go look at how to do that as opposed to looking at the things that we're asking people to do with their homes and saying, does that make sense to make it blanket for all zones the same? If it ends up that it does, we have a general bylaw. So and then maybe what we have to, maybe the larger discussion is, and we're getting again into a debate, not really facts. Maybe the discussion is, do we want to, and forget the general bylaw or the zoning bylaw, but do we want to break this down into different zoning areas and treat them differently, or do we want to treat the whole town together? That, that's so, a good question. So I think we should vote on that because that well, would let's, let's talk about it first. Can we look at the specifics as, as we go through this? I think that'll become that those will be the questions we're asking. I, I disagree. I think we need to have a bigger picture, Ed. I think we need to make this decision. I think what Steve is is um, proposing is is right. You know, do we want to spot zone or do we want to look at the greater good of the community? That's and not what spot zoning is. As town council has advised us, it is a general bylaw. So why don't we just take it from that point and and you can <coughs> pick out the point that you feel that might trigger it as a zoning bylaw, and and we'll address that. That's what I plan to do as we go through it. But we need to have a bigger picture. We have to have a sense right. of general bylaw. So what I'm proposing is that we make this decision now, and I'd like to call for a vote. You're asking to make a decision on what kind of a bylaw it is before we know what's in it. I'm saying let's go through it, decide what we're going to put in it, and then we'll know what it is. And we have it in front of us. We, we've but talked about this for five months. We have the not agreed on this. That's, that's, uh, I thought that's what we're doing tonight. We're talking about this, yes? We need to have a sense of what direction we are going in. So it's hard to do a bylaw when we don't know if it's a zoning or general. And I'd like to say a vote because we've actually gone through this. We have had planning board uh, give this back to us as a general bylaw. We've had town council agree that this is a general bylaw. This is something that's going to impact the entire town, not just residential, not just zones. This isn't the bylaw the planning board gave us. On in circle, Steve, I would really like to, to make a decision and, and move on. This is not the, part, the bylaw the planning board gave us. This is the one you, you wrote after that. But every bylaw that we've looked at has been a general bylaw. We haven't gone through the specifics. Yes, this was written as a general bylaw. I mean, again, tell me we have to treat all zones of the same and have that vote. And then I'll just argue that some of these points don't make sense because we're treating okay. all zones the same. But so that seems like that. Okay. Seems the Let's after have the motion. I make a motion that this is uh, general, that we um, continue with our discussion and recommend a general bylaw on short-term rental regulations to a uh, town meeting. I second. And by that, you mean treating all zones the same? Correct. I mean, that, that's really the crux of the issue. Do we want, I, I'm not worried whether we are designing a general bylaw or a zoning. It's, it's the meat of it, which is that we want to, treat all zones the same. Any discussion? Yes, some of the things in here don't make sense to treat all zones the same. So uh, as we discuss it, you'll bring those up and we may have to change our vote, whatever that may be. Roll well, call vote. Change our vote. Wouldn't we just um, address that depending on how this vote goes? So if, if it's gone as a general or a zoning, when we get to an item that is questionable, wouldn't we just pull that out and continue to go in the direction that this vote is going to be taken rather than pull, you know, stop everything and say, okay, we have to again decide whether it's zoning or general. I, I do agree with you, except that I do like to keep my mind open. And if Ed brings up some good points, which it's, he has in the past, I don't want to just say, no, we can't do that. We may, but you're right. We're going to lean 
depending how we vote, we're going to lean towards, if we say it's going to be a general bylaw, we're going to lean towards making all zones the same. And if we lean to, if we say we want it to be zoning, then we'll separate them. But if, we, so if someone can make a point, it could be you, Garfield, Lee, Ed, that we really can't do that, then we may have to rethink it. But at this point in time, this vote is what we're trying to do right now. So roll call vote, Garfield. We are roll call voting on whether it's a general bylaw or not. Whether, we're, whether our intent is to treat all zones the same and make this a general bylaw. All right. Ed. No. Lee. Aye. And I. So let's move ahead. Uh, Chris, do you want to go over purpose and intent? Sure, happy to. Do you, do you want to see this on screen or is that helpful to you or the audience to see it? Or? I think it's helpful for the audience. <clears throat> okay. While you're doing that, there are 39 people attending the meeting at this point. Uh, the four bullets here under purpose and intent. And by the way, this this version is, I suppose, an amalgamation of several versions, main comments in the planning board version and previous versions that this board has seen in sample versions that you've that you've uh, sourced from uh, Lennox, Stockbridge, for example. So there's a a lot of different things in here, but these four bullets are ones that you essentially agreed on at the three bullets that you agreed on at the last meeting. The one question that came up here was in the first bullets, uh, first bullet enabling residents and that term was question residents. Um, so I wanted to flag that as a point of discussion. So it may be more appropriate to use the term property owners. I agree. I agree. Um, isn't that a landlord tenant discussion? In other words, if the property owner doesn't mind the tenant doing it, why are we uh, ruling otherwise? I think we're going to get to the point, Ed. I we thought have... we had talked that. I thought you, maybe I misunderstood you. I thought you agreed that it would be the, uh, the landlord, the property owner who would control the short term rental, not the. Um... Right. But if, so if, the, if the landlord gives their consent, why is that a problem? Because the person responsible for the property is the person who owns the property. Right. So, so even the, though they've given their consent, now we don't have the person who owns the property in charge of the short-term rental. And that seems to be problematic to me. Mm -hmm. no. I agree, Steve. I think that this is a matter of accountability and transparency, and we need to be able to attach an owner of a property of um, a, a property uh, that's a person that's on the deed um, to the ability to operate a short-term rental. So I think that we, we when once, once we get uh, through this a little bit farther, we could um, add in the distinction about uh, a tenant not being able to operate a short-term rental. Yeah, I actually thought we had. I don't know why this is being brought up again, but just to clarify that. Okay. It can be brought up again. Because there was no agreement on the term residence. So I, I tried to distinguish what you could use instead of residence and prompted the question. Yeah, I, with owner, which we're going to have again under, under the definition of operator, which I did bring up last time, is um, if I'm an owner of a, of a property and my spouse is not on the deed, is my spouse the operator also? Are my adult children the operator? If I'm disabled and unable to handle the day-to-day, the -day, um, and but somebody else is here who can, is that the operator? And they would be appointed to that person, right? Yes, I, you... I have a definition to offer once we get to that point of a, of a owner. So I can offer that, that will help you with that definition, Ed. So it sounds like you got three in favor of property owners. Correct. Steve? Yes. Uh, questions about definitions. Uh, there was a definition for booking agent in one of the proposals, and I, I wasn't sure if we needed it, so I proposed that for deletion. Everybody okay? Yeah. Um, hey, Chris. Just I wanted to add um, the definition of owner, and I'm just since we're going alphabetically, I don't know if this is the right time to offer what I have um, drafted. Okay. Everybody okay with inspector and operator? Well, it depends what a, a, 
the word owner in operator. Is that what you're about to define? Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> want to read something out and see if everyone agrees that that's. It's probably an appropriate time to do that since, oh, since yeah. that's correct. That if we're going to say oh. the operator is correct, we have to know what an owner is to say oh, the operator is correct. Um, any person who, and, and this is, I've, I've gotten this from another short term uh, rental ordinance. Any person who alone or severally with others has legal or equitable title or a beneficial interest in any dwelling unit, a mortgagee in possession or agent, trustee, or other person appointed by the courts, a person whose sole interest in any building, dwelling unit, or portion thereof is solely that of a leasee under a lease agreement shall not be considered an owner. That seems pretty clear. So that, again, I have the question about, about my spouse who's not on the deed. Would not be allowed to do this? Correct. Uh, my adult children wouldn't be allowed to do this? Exactly. Good. And yeah. if I don't have what it takes to be able to do it, I can't name someone else? Correct. Yeah, I disagree with that. Okay, well, we can take a vote. I'd be happy to. We probably don't need a vote. We can nod heads. Okay, should I call for a nodding of a head, Steve? No, it's, I think, it's still my job to do that, both you and Ed know that. Um, I'm just thinking that, um, I mean, that seems clear to me. Um, I mean, Ed, you object to that, correct? I, I, my objection, which I'm going to keep bringing up, is we're micromanaging what people can do with their homes. So to tell me that my spouse can't handle this, can't manage the short-term rental in the house we live in together, because his or her name isn't on the lease, that seems to me to be micromanaging what someone does with their home, and unnecessarily. So, yeah, that's my objection to it. Okay. And you'll be hearing that a lot. Ed, do you want to change operator to an owner or owner's designee and the owner can yes. designate an immediate family member or spouse? Yeah. Well, the same thing. I, I object with that. Okay. Garfield, how do you think about that? Well, I would wonder why we could not uh, appoint someone else uh, other than the person that is on there. If it's a family member, not anyone in the house like the spouse or an adult child. I'm not quite sure because they're all in the same family, so. So can I say something, please? Of course. Um, if, if someone has a deed uh, as a couple, you know, both, um, you know, both people in, in the marriage will be on the deed or if two people own, if it's not a marriage, you know, you can put a second person on the deed. So it's not um, trying to just say one person is the owner. If, if it's a couple or if, um, you know, a, a joint, um, you know, if two people own uh, are on the deed that, you know, that qualifies them as an owner. So it's, it's someone that um, is consistent that it is listed with the property. And what happens is once we start getting into the, the gray territory of uh, someone that's designated and then there's a um, someone leaves and, and is still listed as the des um, designated party, then we, we start losing the accountability of, of tracing this. And um, this has been used in many, many other ordinances. Um, and the definition of an owner is very, very clear. It's, it's a legal definition. And... Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. I just think that we start getting into gray territory when we start talking about designating uh, other people that that don't um, that don't have the accountability that we need to operate a short-term rental. If I, well, may, I do, I do. Agree. Agree. Go ahead, Garfield. I'm sorry. Is I my feeling is if the person is incapacitated, I just don't mean it just happens. But if this, if Ed, if we will, because we're speaking of him, is unable to perform. Uh, what his duties are in this position, then I think I don't see a problem with someone else. If we have to have some way of swearing them in, et cetera, then I think that's not a bad idea. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with Garfield. I think the, I agree with the definition of owner. I would just make it an owner or owner's legal designee. Okay. I mean, that way, by saying legal designee, and we'll pick on Ed tonight, Ed doesn't just say, yeah, over there, that person's my designee. Right. They, there has to be some thought into it, and there has to be some way that we can trace it back through a legal document. Great. Yeah. So we get, Do you agree um, with that, Ed? Yes. 
Okay. So mm -hmm. could we just uh, have town council refer that because we just need to see what kind of paper or you know, <laughs> way of verifying there's a legal uh, connection there. Yeah. Uh, when we're mostly through this, we will okay. have town council look at that. Okay. So owner as Lee submitted and operator as just amended. We okay with striking primary residence and proof of primary residence? Yes. Yeah. Anything else to discuss in, Wait. Uh, oh, we've got another discussion point under secondary unit. Could you, could you re, uh, read owner again? I'm not sure what you meant about as Lee designated. Um, oh, uh, the, the one that Lee read, yeah, sorry. I, I can submit this, but I'll be happy to read it if you'd like. Do you mean to go with an owner or legal designee? Uh, the, the operator would change to an owner or legal designee. Okay, but I don't see a definition of owner anywhere. We just added that. Yeah, that's the yeah. one that we read. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, um, I'll send this and I'll copy everyone. And we'll put it into the next version, and you can make sure it's right. Um, secondary unit. This is intended to capture the possible existence of other dwellings on the parcel. Hopefully, it addresses that. Any other definitions we need? Um, I had, oh, I had a question about uh, short-term rental. The definition, um, it refers, it has a reference to zoning. So I was just wondering um, about that. I'm not sure we have to keep the word zoning out of it completely, do we, Chris? I just wanted no. to. No, it's just, um... I don't see that anywhere in other ordinances. So, technically, a hotel is a short-term rental, technically, because it rents rooms for, you know, on a night by nice or night or less than 30, 30 consecutive days. So this is just making the point that if, if you're defined and permitted as a hotel or lodging house, you're not a short-term rental for this bylaw. As defined and permitted under the zoning bylaw. I'm just wondering, is, is that going to attach us, you know, unnecessarily to the zoning bylaw? I, I've just, I've never seen any ordinance that has um, a reference to a zoning bylaw and a general bylaw. So I just wanted to get clarification. Not. We will try to get clarification. I did want to add something or suggest an addition to that, please, um, because I have had questions about this. Um, so when it says, uh, this is what I had, a residential unit, it basically was gonna suggest adding a phrase that says, other than ongoing month to month tenancy granted to the same renter for the same unit. Um, because I've, I've had a few people ask about if it, <laughs> this qualify as a, um, a short-term rental. And I have seen other ordinances that add the phrase, other than ongoing month to month tenancy, granted to the same renter for the same unit. And this would be tagged on to a residential unit in whole or in part to any persons for a duration of not more than 30 consecutive calendar days, other than ongoing month to month tenancy granted to the same renter for the same unit. Just to clarify um, that, you know, if someone has a, a month to month that this is not um, gonna be uh, considered a short-term rental. And I have seen that clarity provided in other ordinances. I can check with council to see whether that's needed. Um, it seems to me that the general law excludes so-called tenancies at will from the definition. Uh, so we may not need it, statute might cover it, but if you all would like me to check, we can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind. It's, is that for not clarity really it's, it's not to, I cheat. Need to check I, I don't know that it's necessary but it's fine to check yeah. okay On to rules and regulations. Yes. 
What would you like to allow? What would you like to prohibit? Uh, the first two here come from Stockbridge. Uh, we would add C if you're prohibiting tenants from subleasing, which it seems like you're doing. Except if they're you're asking here. If the tenant is the the legal designee. Well, but the tenant's not subleasing. It's still the owner sub who is subleasing. The uh, I would say at least, and I'm not pretending to be a lawyer. The tenant would be acting on behalf of the owner. Right. But, so that's different than a, you know, the, Ed. That seems to be that you're trying to get. We've already determined, or I, I believe that we had determined last week that we weren't going to have um, subleasing of short-term rentals. So. Right. I'm curious why you're, you've asked that to be just, as part I'm of just, We just legal. defined operator as a designee. So I don't know what gymnastics we would have to use to prohibit this tenant being a designee. Tenant well, could be a designee, right? but they're, they're not, that's different than them subleasing. Correct. I mean, it clearly, would clearly have the permission of the owner. Um, well, I, I have a question about that because I feel strongly that we shouldn't allow tenants to to be operators. So I believe um, you know I you had a three to so oh, sorry Lee. you had a three to one vote on that discussion we had about the purpose statement. I know, but this is different than a tenant. You know, we're talking about um, Ed, you know when Ed was talking about he was talking about a family member. And now he seems to be uh, extending this to tenancy and to subleasing. And for me, those are two different um, issues. And from what I re recall, last week we decided that we weren't going to allow subleasing of short-term rental. So I'm I'm confused as to your your direction that you're taking this. I, I guess. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Ed. I do. I don't know. What, I mean, we just said the operators allowed to designate somebody. I, so yeah, full disclosure, I don't understand the problem with a tenant doing it with, I mean, we're not, our, our goal here is not to stop short-term rentals, no. right? That's not one of the purposes. So okay. if, I don't I don't see, you know, this, this, the house is already a rental. It's a year round rental. Uh, the owner is okay with, and the tenant is okay with one of the rooms being used short-term rental to maybe they will both make some money at it, maybe just the tenant, but it's okay with the owner. I'm not sure what why we would stop it. But that aside, if we have, if we do decide we don't want to allow that, and again, I don't know why we would, I don't know how we say the landlord, the owner can designate someone to operate for him as long as it isn't a tenant. I don't know how we say that. Just like yes, so, so that's why I had a question about adding designee to, to an operator. So we, we get into this gray territory. And um, the issue with subleasing, Ed, is, is that if you have um, a long, if you have someone that is um, a long-term uh, tenant, right? So you have a landlord and they own a house and um, they, it's a non-occupied uh, home. So if they're limited by whatever days that we come up with tonight, whether it's 90 or 120, whatever, um, once you have a, a tenant that's subleasing it, then you're, um, they're falling under the guise of owner occupied and they could then in turn around and, and rent the entire property for the entire year, um, thus taking away um, a long-term rental away from someone that, that would be there. So there's that kind of gray area that you're getting um, someone that owns uh, like an investor, for instance, that doesn't live on the property that, that rents it to a long-term tenant and then they turn around and short-term rental. So it's this um, lack of accountability and transparency that we're creating. And so once you enable um, an investor to, to turn around and, and do a long-term rental, then they in turn, use a short-term rental, you're, you're taking that option. You're taking an ability for a resident to actually have a home away because we're, we're, we're um, going against the purpose and intent of, of deterring uh, this commercial activity. So you're losing that connection. And if you, once it's owner occupied, then you can have, you know, for 365 days, you can rent rooms and, and that's the connection. But once you get into this kind of gray territory of a tenant, subleasing 
to uh, a visitor, are they under the 90 day and 120 day cap or are they under the 365 day? But either way, they're, they're taking a long term uh, rental away from from a resident, from someone that's that's you know invested in the community. So what I'm what I'm saying is that you're losing that connection and that, that accountability. But I'm not sure what purpose the one of our purposes is not to stop short term rentals. Right. That's not a purpose here. It is a year round rental. It's it's a year round rental. There's a tenant in it. There are extra bedrooms that the tenant is renting out. I'm not sure what the problem is. The rent, the year round rental is still there. Yes, I, I guess my only problem going back and we're full circle, unfortunately, is that what I don't want to happen is that the owner of the property, which we've defined, is not the responsible party. Right. So that, that's what I'm trying to avoid is that the owner of the property says, well, you know, you call them, there's a problem, there's an inspection problem. They say, no, I'm not the one who's renting this. It's my tenant or it's my neighbor. And, and that, that that's not going to fly with me. Right. I assume the form that we use for the legal designee um, you know, lists the owner is still responsible. Right. We, we will design that. Can I say something? Of course. Um, so, so what happens, Ed, is, is that, uh, you know, we're trying to deter people from taking housing stock and using it as short-term rentals, right? Maybe not. So we're, 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 trying to limit, we're trying to limit investors that aren't living here to take housing stock away from long-term rentals, which is, which is, um, which is happening. Right. So, so these, these would be long-term rentals. There's a tenant in it. I know, but if they're turning around and short-term rental renting that, if, if the tenant leaves, let's say, let's say it's it's rent, it's subleased to them and then they leave and they go to Florida and then all of a sudden becomes a short-term rental for all year round, where's the accountability? It's not year round. There's a tenant. That's when the, the tenant is there. There are extra bedrooms. The tenant rents them out. So so my other question is Ed when you get into this kind of gray area, um, then you start getting into to loopholes. And what's to say that um, someone that is renting a, an apartment is not going to uh, charge a higher rent with the provision that the, the tenant can turn around and, and start making $400 a night. So, you know, again, that, that kind of leads to this, this, um, this increase of rents because ultimately you're treating it as um, a, another way to, to make money. So, Rather than just having a long-term renter and you know having that price fix, you're kind of creating this gray, this gray territory of a landlord of an investor, let's say, um, charge being able to change charge more rent because in turn uh, this this person is short-term renting and, and getting a kickback. So it, it, again, there's a long-term renter there. It is a long-term rental. There's a long there's a lease. Somebody has a long-term rental. They're in it. They have extra bedrooms. What's the difference whether I rent out extra bedrooms in my house, which I can do year round, or I've rented my whole house to a tenant for the year and he or she rents out extra bedrooms year round. It doesn't change the neighborhood. We're not trying to stop short-term rentals and we haven't turned it into a corporate owned uh, it, business. It, it, you're, you're, you're losing that connection between the owner and someone that's accountable that, that no, actually- The tenant would be accountable. They have signed the paper that they're accountable. But I'm saying that you're then creating this this opportunity. You're creating a, a commercial activity in a in a building between a tenant and a, a visitor. So you're adding to this mix. You're creating this gray area of you know not only do you have a tenant, but now you have a tenant mixed in with a visitor. So why why are you gripping on to this this um, this ability just to have an owner and have a long-term tenant. Why do you have to bring in this mix of the long-term tenant then being able to, to have a commercial activity that then uh, raises the rent potentially and, and causes disruption in neighborhoods? So we're trying to um, not make our neighborhoods into, into hotels. So there's- that's it's, Also, that's not a purpose either. But there's an, okay, it, we're deterring commercial activity, Ed. Okay. No, we're deterring commercial interest from buying housing to use primarily as short-term rentals. Yes. This would not be that. So if, so that Car Carfield, I believe you had something to say. I just thought it might cause a big legal hassle to tenants. All of a sudden, he's going to say, well, his, I'm not signing the papers, but I'm not the legal owner. 
and then you're going to get some infighting and it's going to have no one to to be responsible i don't i just don't i don't like the idea of a tenant doing that and i do think it would be cause a problem and i can see the owner saying well you sign this so now it's your responsibility and the tenants going to say i don't own this home it's your home so we're going to get into some hassle so maybe we can avoid it by not having the tenant allowed to do that i agree i'd, I'd like to make a vote or ask for a vote please steve yes go ahead i'd like to um make a uh i'd like to propose that we do not allow subleasing for short-term rentals uh second that discussion ed no no said it already garfield aye ed no aye and lee aye aye okay let's move ahead we're, we're coming up to a time limit of probably another 15 minutes uh, okay, here's the next uh, point of discussion. Discussion is item two, is uh, trying to figure out if there is a total number of nights per calendar year that you would like to limit this at. So it was discussed previously, but, uh, and different towns use different numbers. Lennox has uh, their own number. It was discussed last time that that may or may not fit Great Barrington's season. Uh, so it's blank for your discussion. So I need to apologize here at the last meeting. I, you know, I, I, I was asked off the top of my head, I made up a number. I have no idea what the number is that allows a retiree to afford their life in Florida and their house here, but also discourages somebody from buying a house, sorry, a corporation from buying a house solely for Airbnb. So I, I don't know what that number is. I don't know how we do, but I do want to apologize because last time I threw out a number, but yeah, I, I think your point, Ed, that whatever number we use is going to be based on other towns, what they've used. There is no formula that I know of to come up with for this. Yeah. But um, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, it, it was mentioned in a local paper that I think Ed quoted, um, was quoted last week as saying, 90 was an arbitrary number that I, that I kind of pulled this out of the, um, the sky. And I, I wanted to talk about, um, I wasn't able to, to really go into depth, but I did want to, to mention a report that actually um, speaks to how a town or a city comes to, um, to limiting uh, the number of short-term rentals. So I just quickly want to mention, um, there's a report on the regulation of short-term rentals by the San Francisco Office of Economic Development. And what they did is they were looking at, um, you know, they were looking at two different ordinances and they were trying to study how they would actually come up with, with a limit. So what they did is they studied the incentives that exist to remove a unit from the housing market by comparing the income that it could earn as a short-term rental versus a long-term rental. And, um, and this is something that they did, you know, they were in the same position as, as we are. Uh, that study uh, calculated that removing a single housing unit from the market so that it could be a, a short-term rental, that it would have a, a total negative economic impact on their economy of minus $250,000 to minus uh, $330,000 um, per year. So a negative economic impact on the economy of minus $250,000 um, by taking a single unit of housing from the market. Um, to, to go on a little bit with that is basically they say a housing unit withdrawn from the market to be used for short-term rentals produces a negative in, impact on the town, even if that unit generates host income, visitor spending, and hotel tax. And the reason why I'm bringing this up in this um, in this discussion is that what they did is they reported, uh, they analyzed the average number of days that a host would need to engage in short-term renting to equal the average income they would receive from uh, residential renting. So what happens is when an investor is looking uh, at a community and, and they're, they're deciding whether it's worth buying a piece of property solely to run a short-term rental. You know, they're, they're looking at performer. They're, they're looking at, you know, what would they make per year as a long-term rental and what they would be making as a short-term rental. So this is um, what the San Francisco study did. So if you look about it um, at, at it from an investor that, that could come in, and these are the people that we are trying to deter. We're trying to deter someone that comes in 
specifically to to rent short term and, and take um, a piece of property off the housing market. So in Great Barrington's case, what I found is the cost, the average cost um, of a rental, of short term rental in Great Barrington currently is three hundred forty seven dollars a night. So if let's say hypothetically the limit is set set to ninety nights, that comes to thirty one thousand, just over thirty one thousand dollars. If an investor is then looking at what they would make as a long term rental, and we look at around fifteen hundred dollars a month for twelve months, they see that they're making eighteen thousand dollars. And so what what San Francisco did is is they were looking at they were analyzing this, and they they saw that if if you um, compact the uh, the incentive for a host to come in, for an investor to come in, and um, and take that and um, shrink that gap between what they would make as a short-term rental versus a long-term rental, then you're taking away that incentive for them to come in and, and specifically invest in a, in a property for short-term rentals. So I guess what my point is that um, they, they're looking at a break-even limit and they are um, looking at the break-even limit and they're saying, you know, the difference between these numbers is what would drive an investor to come into a community and solely buy a property to short-term rent. And they have a, um, a break-even analysis. And they said, when setting a limit of days that um, their break-even analysis results found that setting a limit of days that one can rent below this break-even point has a more positive impact on the town. So what they did is they looked at what someone would make a long-term rental versus a short-term rental. And they were saying that you find that break-even point and you go below that. So, um, so that, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to look at, let's say we use 90 days. So someone that was limited to 90 days would be making $31,000 um, a year, roughly. Someone that had the same property and let's say they were charging $1,500 a month for it, they'd be making $18,000. So you're trying to um, take that incentive away. And um, so based on this, if we were going to find that magic number, we would be looking more for like 52 days, which would come closer to the $18,000. Now, I'm not advocating that for any way, but what I am saying is that 90 days is actually something that is doable, that, um, that deters an investor enough that they might think twice about coming here specifically to take um, a piece of property off the, the long-term rental market and use it solely for short-term rental. And this is aligned with our purpose and intent of, of deterring commercial activity. And so I feel really strongly that the 90 days is, um, is a good uh, limit. San Francisco has actually used 90 days. So after doing this report and looking at that break even analysis, they, they also settled on 90 days. Now we're not San Francisco, we're not Linux, but we can see, a, you know, we, we can find a median and we can see that Lennox um, went between 75 days and 110 days. Now their limit was 75 days. Um, to get to 110 days, they have to have a special permit. So I think, you know, um, I would not be in favor of, of making people jump through more hoops. But I think, you know, pushing it up to 90 days is, is, is enough to deter um, an investor, yet it gives a nice cushion for people trying to, to meet their mortgage. And um, as we said, we want to make sure that residents have the ability to cover their mortgage, to go away um, for several months and, and have that, that cushion. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, that break-even analysis, that there was something done and it was really looking at how an investor thinks um, when they come into a municipality to, to buy a piece of property. So um, I am advocating to stick with the 90 days. And that's so, a so Lee, I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. I'm not a real fan of the 90 days, as you and I've talked about. I may support it, but yep. I'm not an economist. But the same place that rents for $375 a night as a short-term rental, mm -hmm. I have trouble believing they would only get $1,500 for a month. What, I'm that, saying that just doesn't seem. What's that? That's a long-term rental, Steve. So yeah, I, know, I understand that, but if I was getting three hundred seventy-five dollars a night, it must be a pretty nice place. Mm -hmm. And fifteen hundred a month seems to be um, fairly low. So I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, no, no. Maybe I'm yeah. just 
Yeah, I probably didn't explain it very well. What I was saying is the average short-term rental is, is $347 per night. And I was looking at what people are generally, you know, that is on the high term of $1,500 a month. So if, if you have a house and you're going to rent it for to a long-term full-time resident, um, if you look at renting that for $1,500 a month for 12 months, that's what I was saying. I was saying someone comparing a, a, a house and saying I could long-term rent and get $1,500 a month, or I could be limited to, let's say, 90 days and, and make $30,000. So what you're doing is you're trying to compress that gap and you're trying to, to um, de-incentivize um, the, the ability for an investor to come in based on that. So and, what, and, I, and I do understand, I guess, yeah. uh, I'd be curious at what houses rent for in Great Barrington. And I know duplexes may rent for 15 or 18 or 1900. Um, yeah. Maybe I'm just being a little thick as it gets later. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm being generous. So even if you, you say uh, it's closer to $1,000, so that's... No, 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 I'm saying it's closer to 2500 Okay, well, exactly. So if, if you go 2400, that's great. We're getting towards that break even point. And that would actually make more sense, because then an investor really has to think twice about it. So what we're trying to do is, is go on the side of, you know what, um, maybe this, I'm not going to make enough money here. And it's, I'll go somewhere else and, and short term rental. And guess what, then a resident that is, is looking for a home, we have, we know we have a 0% rental vacancy rate has an ability to actually live in this community. So we're trying to, to have enough deterrent um, at, at the same time, giving um, residents and second homeowners the, the ability to, to pay their mortgage. So it's that sweet spot. And what this um, this report does is that they analyze that and they actually, you know, looked between the money that that break even analysis. And, you know, they sound they found that, you know, setting the limit of days well below that break even point, you know, had a, a positive impact on the town. Um, one thing I will say why I'm on this um, is that there was some mention um, that that we would be uh, taking away the economic uh, impact of um, by, by, by lessening the short-term rentals in town, this would affect uh, the economy in Great Barrington. And what I do wanna say is, is residents shop in Great Barrington. So to say that by limiting short-term rentals, you're gonna, you're gonna um, impact uh, negatively the economy, um, I, I don't get that. I, I, don't, I disagree uh, very strongly with that because residents do shop. So um, you know, to, to replace one with the other, I think is, is not a good argument because if someone, if a property is there and whether it's a short-term rental or a resident that lives there full year round, they're still going to be shopping. They're still going to be eating. They're going to be contributing to the <coughs> community. They're going to be sending their kids to the school. And, and that's where they get that correlation of, you know, if a house is taken off the market as a long-term rental and made into a short-term rental, you're losing three hundred thousand dollars per unit, and I, I, you know, we we can't dismiss that. That is something that's in a report um, that was done, and they analyzed that. So there is a cost to a, a, um, a municipality if we start taking uh, units off of the market just to short-term rental. So there is an impact um, on downtown, and it's more than you would have by having a resident live in the house. So for people that are making that argument that um, the economy is gonna collapse if we limit the short-term rentals, I, I disagree, and, and this report actually backs that up. Garfield, Ed. I, you wanna go, Garfield? I've been talking a lot. No, 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 I, I... No, nothing to say. All right. So San Francisco is the most expensive housing market in America. Um, and I can't imagine any study they've done on housing has anything to do with what's going on here, especially if you're getting as specific as how many days of a short term rental makes sense. Um, the, yeah, I, I agree with Steve. I don't think you can find some $1,500 a month. Um, the mostly my concern is that number being made up, there are expenses, right? If you do a short-term rental, you're not putting $300 a night in your pocket. You're paying cleaning people. You're, pay, you're keeping that house in a much better condition than you would keep the house that you live in because you're going to get reviewed. Uh, there, are, there are expenses. There are taxes. There are things like that. But my bigger concern is, and the group that I'm most concerned about with all of this is how many retirees who aren't here 
um, need to keep their house available for when they are here, are we gonna hurt in order to kick out or prevent how many corporations from buying houses? And we don't know either of those numbers. So my concern to say $30,000 is enough to pay a mortgage, I don't do people's finances for them. I don't know that $30,000 is enough to pay expenses, pay a mortgage, supplement their social security. Like this is their biggest asset and we're putting a huge cap on how much they can make on that asset. Uh, that's, that's my concern. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, my guess is that would deter uh, a corporation from coming in and buying a house and using it solely for Airbnb, but we've already outlawed that. You can't do that if you're a corporation. Yes, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, um, so thank you, Ed. I'd like to talk about you know our purpose and intent and one of the purposes and intents that we agreed on was deterring commercial interest from buying housing to use primarily as short-term rental businesses. So uh, what I'm saying is that if we are mindful of the decisions that an investor comes in, um, in making a decision whether to buy a property just to short-term rental, we need to keep that in mind that we're trying to uh, align ourselves to our purposes uh, and intent. So if, if that is the case, we need to uh, incentivize um, that enough that we don't have these investors coming in um, looking at the dollar signs. So how you do the dollar signs is, is you, you take away that incentive. You make it harder for them to make money solely off short-term rentals. So what this is doing is this is giving uh, the seniors that you're mentioning, um, Ed, enough cushion that they can meet their their um, their mortgage. But it's also deterring uh, investors from coming in to uh, strictly um, use this as a cash cow and a gravy train and and take housing that should be for um, people that actually want to live here and invest here, um, taking that away, that ability away from them. So it's that it's that balance. And I appreciate you saying that we're not San Francisco. And my point is not aligning ourselves to San Francisco, but pointing out that there is a way to calculate that break even analysis and to say, you know, how does an investor look at Great Barrington and what would make them decide to come here um, buy a, a piece of property, evict the residents that are there, the long-term residents, kick them out and, and make this a short-term rental. And that is something that we have to um, admit that this is happening. And what this bylaw is trying to do is to, to prevent that. And so there is a break in even analysis and we know we are not San Francisco, but we are um, able to do the calculations and we are able to look at it from the investor's point of view. So again, if an investor can make X amount, um, they're gonna they're gonna still buy that property. So we need to make it limiting enough that it deters these people, yet gives um, residents and second homeowners enough cushion. Now, when is enough enough, Ed? You know, then we're gonna talk about well, they want to go, you know, their third house and and their you know their trip to to you know skiing in Aspen. I mean, there's a point that we need to that there's a tipping point. And no one's going to be happy with this, but we really need to think about the greater good and why we're doing this at all. And we need to keep coming back to this purpose intent. So we're, we're deterring the commercial activities. And this is one way to do it. So if we keep extending the limits, you're making it easier for investors to, uh, you're incentivizing them to come in and, and take properties off the market. And we have zero rentals, long-term rentals right now. We have over 200 short-term rentals. We have 171 entire homes that are being short-term rental right now. We have zero long-term rentals, okay? So obviously there, there's a disconnect there and I'm just trying to find that sweet spot and there is a sweet spot. Lennox um, you know, went through to two town meetings to find that sweet spot. Uh, and they they settled on 75 days. So I think 90 days is is, is enough. And um it's it's getting it's it's giving you that break-even analysis and uh, deterring investors enough, but I think allowing residents and second homeowners enough money to to really cover the mortgage. So um, you know, I, I feel very strongly that if we go, if, if, if we tip too much, then we're losing the intent and purpose of this bylaw. And what I would like to, to say is, is let's put um, something in front of the residents and the citizens and let them vote on it. Rather than haggle over days, let's do our best to, to be aligned with our purpose and intent. So, so a couple of things. It, it's getting later now, and our purpose of this meeting was actually 
first and foremost, the priority planning. So I don't want to go much longer, but I would say that one of our most important decisions is this number. I, I think um, both of you have strong arguments. I'm not ready to vote tonight on it. No one would be happy if I was voting on it tonight. Um, I think we need to, to sit on it and, and think about it a little bit. Um, I, I can live with 90, but I'm not sure that um, 90 is the right number. You're right. Um, Ed, there, that's, there well, are, there's data out there, but I also want it to be for Great Barrington and what works. Um, but what I don't want to happen is to pick a number that penalizes the residents of Great Barrington either. Go ahead, Lee. Um, so I, I appreciate that, Stephen. My question is, um, you know, coming back to the purpose and intent, and you know, what we're we're trying to do is, um, you know, we're, we're trying to deter commercial activity. So there is a there is a sweet spot, and. My worry is that if we keep increasing, if, if we decrease the cap, if we, we keep increasing this limits, let's say from 90 to 110 to 120, you know, that's just incentivizing investors to come in and, and take away housing stock. And, uh, and, and I understand everything you're saying, but you know, it's, I'll, I'll try to make this articulate enough so that I don't babble. But when a town manager or superintendent comes to me and says that their initial budget is $3 million and they've cut it by 10%. Well, they haven't cut anything because there's no budget there. It hasn't been approved yet. And this, this is the same idea. You're, you're proposing 90 days, which I think is a rational uh, something to discuss, but I, I'm just, I'm not quite there in the pit of my stomach yet to say 90 days is the right one. Um, it, it's a number that you've put a lot of thought into and I appreciate that. And I just have to think about it a little more. That's all. I'm just not sure I'm ready. It's, um, it isn't a number that's cast in stone. Um, I know I don't want 200 days and I understand what our intent is. And I agree with you hundred percent that we don't want to make it so enticing that we haven't done, that this bylaw has no teeth, but I, I'm just not right there yet. That's all. So I'm not saying you're wrong. You're probably, probably when I think about it more, you're probably right, but I, so I want to hear more from people and I want to be able to just think about it some more. Ed Garfield, Lee, closing thoughts on this? Garfield? I don't think, I think the 90 days is a good amount. I am concerned myself about uh, incentivizing others to come in and just to, to make money. So, I, and there's always a cap to everything and anything that we do. And I wish I could be more specific at the moment, but there's always controls on anything in life or what we do. So this being control is not going to be any different than um, saying that you can only have so and so many people in your home at a time. Those are rules that are made. That's how it works. That's how things are done. So no, and I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be a cap, Garfield, just to be clear before anyone misunderstands. I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be a cap and I'm not suggesting that 90 is wrong. I, I'm not saying that either, see, I'm just saying that things work. That's how the world works. Right. I have another thing. I, I just don't want to lose sight the fact that this is only an occupied, you know, owner unoccupied homes, you know, when the host is not present. Um, I want to make it very, very clear that we are looking after residents and owners. So if you're in the house, you can rent all year round. You can short-term rent all year round. So I think it's very, very um important that we uh, point out that this is only properties that the owner is not present. So what I'm honing in on are those investors that come in specifically to buy a property and they, they have no intention of, of doing anything in this community. So what, what I am saying is that people that live here that actually you know, are in their homes, they can short-term rental all year round. This is not affecting them. So I just wanna make it very, very clear. We're talking about people that buy houses that are not um, on the property. So 90 days, in, in my mind, um, gives them plenty of time to, to re, you know, to, um, you know, get their money back in terms of the money spent on the mortgages. So again, it's unoccupied. Um, you know, owner is not there in the in the home. So yeah, no, I think your first point about the 365 days of owner occupied is very important because I'm not sure people 
realize that. I don't know that we made it clear. I think you're absolutely right that it, we're not talking about all 200 homes that are short-term rentals in town. We're talking about the ones that um, are occupied less than uh, year round. Um, but there, there's a distinction and, and we're gonna cut this off in a moment. There is a distinction. There's people who live there year round. There's people who own short-term rentals for a profit. Then there's a third section of people who live there part of the year and part of the year they, let's say go south, they go to wherever they go to. And, and we're trying to balance with those 90 days Mm -hmm. what to do with the second two sets, not the people who live there year round, because that's already a given. Yeah. And just to um, to add on to that, please, Steve, you know, when we were having the discussion early on about the the primary residents versus the non-primary residents, so that that was a big leap. And, you know, now we're just talking about limiting days and, um, you know, we're giving the, the, the ability of the second homeowners to to make money when they're not here. Um, to short-term rental. And then when it comes up to, let's say, let's say it is the, the 90 days, um, for the nine months, that could be um, an ability for a resident to come in that's you know, looking to move here that, that needs a few months rent or a student or an artist coming in. So it's not going to be left necessarily unoccupied. It's, it's going to be available for someone that has an investment in this community. So we, we can't lose sight. It's not that we're penalizing them. It's just that, you know, we're, we're limiting their ability to, to turn it into a short-term rental just for visitors. But the beauty of it is that then they have their home and they've made their mortgage, they, they've covered that second home. And just remember that their primary residence is somewhere else. They're invested in another community. And what I'm trying to focus on is the people that invested here that are full-time residents that are working here that are sending their kids to school here and, and they're um, in need of housing you know so we have a, a shortage we have a housing shortage so it's creating that balance it's like recognizing that the second homeowners have invested elsewhere they have a full-time they have a primary residence in a different community they have elected to, to put their kids in a different school they have elected to to you know um, focus their attention there so i'm trying to focus it back on the people that live here that actually really need houses and there are no long-term rental houses so so i i just want to bring that into the mix and just um get, again reiterate that People that live here that are in their homes, they can rent short term all year round. We're not talking about you. Yep. So no, we've abandoned the idea of not dividing the community. We've now divided them into people who live here year round and those who don't. And we've decided that $30,000 is enough for them to cover all their expenses. And uh, I'm, I'm, and, and, I'm not, sorry, I'm not finished. And you've decided they could do a long term rental for the other 90 days, uh, which means they can only use it. Um, they can't use their house, um, which is probably why they have it here. And what I'm saying is we don't know, right? You have no idea how many houses have been purchased that are year round uh, short term rentals where a long term tenant was kicked out. We don't have that number. We've made that up that there is a number. That's we, not true. Ed. The two are people who are written about in the Eagle and that article, neither of them were displaced for short term rentals. Okay, um, I'd like to speak to that. So we do have a person that did write in and they're an attorney in New York and they um, they have written and we have this on record about the 20 tenants that have come to her um, since May of 2021 that have specifically lost their homes due to evictions to make room for short-term rentals. So we actually have records of that. And we you don't keep have a record of that. We have that letter, but they're not all short-term rentals. Some of them are second homeowners who've moved in. Okay, so I'm going to cut it off at this point because I, it's seven fifteen, and we actually have some select board business to do that is as important as this, which is priority planning. So I think we've we've had a good discussion tonight. I think we're we it's time we we get to do this again on Valentine's Day, which is only appropriate, I think. And um, let's move ahead to to priority planning and turn it over to Mark. And the people of their hands up will be allowed to speak during a uh, citizen speak time. Okay, thanks, Steve. Just gonna go ahead and bring Eric back into the meeting and then promote some staff as panelists. So just bear with me here for a second. Thank you. 
Uh, so before we get started, I just want to mention a few things. Uh, so in your packet for this evening and posted on our, our website was a priority planning worksheet. The last time we discussed this was June. And according to our select board uh, policies, we revisit this uh, twice annually. So uh, for anyone wanting to follow along, I'm going to put it up on the screen in just a minute, but it is also on our website and in the uh, posted public packet. Uh, well, staff will walk you through each of these high priorities in just a minute. And for anyone joining us for the first time for one of these sessions, uh, our list is divided into um, high priorities, three categories, really high priorities, moderate priorities, and then those projects that we consider to be completed at this time. And each section uh, within those sections is just divided, um, or sorry, sorted alphabetically. So they're not, they're not ranked within those within those categories. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Chris to get us started with the affordable housing category, please. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so this is a high priority for you all. And there are a few things listed in the comments there pursuing kind of a multi-pronged approach uh, to address the supply and, and um, um, things like that. And, as a quick reminder, you know we've we've done an incredible amount of work to, uh, particularly in zoning, uh, but in other areas as well in terms of funding uh, to increase the supply of uh, housing in town, including affordable housing. Um, so lots of zoning over the years. The planning board has been uh, really proactive in that regard, and town meeting has uh, approved, I believe, almost all of those proposals. Um, you know, going back even just before my time, the, you know, the, the town has donated land to the CDC. That was the Hillside Avenue project. Abated the taxes at the log home site. Um, you know, um, adopted the, the Community Preservation Act. I think we've granted over $1 million towards affordable housing projects. And just last week, uh, it might have been the week before the CPC, voted to recommend that town meeting fully fund all of the affordable housing requests for this year for CPA projects. So there's, there's been a lot that's, uh, that's been happening. Oh, and, and this board opted into the uh, property assessed clean energy program at your last meeting. And that can be used to, um, to help existing multifamily buildings uh, address their energy needs and come into compliance, code compliance and things like that. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund has been working very hard on the Housatonic Home Ownership Project off of North Plain Road in Housatonic. Uh, we're in pre preliminary engineering stage there, uh, and we, we hope to uh, be able to come back to the community with some conceptual plans there uh, in, in the coming months. Uh, so the Housing Trust Fund's working on that. Uh, the, the deed over at 40 Grove Street uh, is being transferred to Habitat for Humanity. So that will be an affordable home, um, permanently affordable home. So that's great. So there's a lot that's going on. And I think all of those strategies should continue. And, and if this, assuming this remains as a top priority, we, we will continue that. Um, some things that... Uh, are active currently, obviously the Houstonic School RFP that could result in some sort of housing, maybe affordable housing. Uh, there's a lot going on also in terms of the town's uh, the properties that the town is um, either foreclosing on for back taxes or we're in tax title on. So we're pursuing those and they may become housing opportunities. Um, we're using our infrastructure funding to take infrastructure, sidewalks, improve roads and drainage uh, around and to housing projects of all kinds. Um, so there's a, there's a lot that's going on. Some things to, to consider that the housing subcommittee, uh, planning board and the housing trust fund and this board have all touched on in, in some ways or another are uh, tax abatements uh, for people who rent uh, maybe an accessory dwelling unit or a unit to uh, um, a lower moderate income household, um, increasing municipal funding to, to projects, to the housing trust fund, um, things like that. Um, 
you know, purchasing deed restrictions for affordable housing, incentivizing the conversion of short-term rentals to affordable housing. Um, all of these things take um, a tremendous amount of buy-in, of cash in some cases. Um, so there's other strategies out there and we can talk about those, we can investigate those, um, uh, whatever you'd like to do. Any questions or comments on that? I just, I have one small thing. Uh, Chris, thank you. Um, and I apologize if, if I, I missed this point, but um, senior housing and I, I'm, you know, I'm cognizant of you know, the seniors that kind of fall that don't qualify, let's say for public, for low income senior housing, but there's middle income seniors. And, um, you know, I realize that we have some projects that have taken um, hold recently, but is that something that um, is worth kind of focus honing in on just seeing that we have a, a growing um, demographic in, in our senior population? Um, is that something we should separate out or? Um, I just, it's, it's more of a, a thought than really anything. Um. The planning board has looked at its bylaws. I mean, we look at the bylaws every year, the zoning bylaws to make sure that different housing types, different housing opportunities uh, can occur in, a, in appropriate places. And we do think about senior housing as well. Um, I hope that in some of these areas where the, the zoning now allows multifamily development, that some of that could be assisted living, senior housing of some kind, age-restricted housing of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the market forces are there in terms of you know, what it actually takes to build one of these. There's not a heck of a lot of land out there in Great Barrington, as you know, uh, real estate prices are always high. Um, mm. So I'm just not sure um, if, uh, I definitely agree that it's a need, uh, that type of product, that type of uh, housing uh, out there in the market, there's a need for that. Our demographic is aging, um, maybe not as much as other towns, but certainly we are. So it is a need, there is a, there is a demand. I'm not sure of what we can do about it, but um, you know, we can definitely keep it on the list and mm -hmm. uh, add that to the market rate, working class, senior, add senior slash senior housing if you want. Yeah. Um, so it's up to you all. I'd very much like that. Could I also ask something that's related to that? Um, I know that there's seniors that, you know, really want to age in place, you know, that they have their homes and they need help to, um, to retrofit it, to, to make it something that they can stay in their homes. And I'm just wondering, is there a way that we can incentivize that, that we can keep seniors in their homes um, and offer um, you know, ways to uh, you know, come into a home and, and make it more accessible for seniors that wanna do that. And uh, you know, to, to do that on a, um, a parallel track. Um, and if there's some kind of, uh, have you heard of programs that, that allow a municipality come in and let seniors to age in place and, and come in and, and do that for them or retrofit well, a house? Well, um, we do participate in a regional community development block grant program, which uh, gives grants to low and moderate income homeowners, um, a lot of times seniors who need uh, to make repairs on the homes that they own so that they remain habitable. So sometimes they need to replace a roof. They're on a fixed income. They don't have the ability to do that. Uh, if they income qualify, they can receive a grant. These programs are incredibly competitive to get the money. And then once we do have the money, the money's very limited and they're always oversubscribed almost instantly. So mm -hmm. there's a big demand for that sort of thing. A lot of people wanna stay in their homes, but the homes are very old. Uh, you can't get a wheelchair in the door or the boilers, you know, 40 years old. Uh, I think the housing stock in Great Barrington, three quarters of it was built, I want to say before 1950 or even World War II. It's very, very old. It's expensive to heat and maintain. So these are, these are, um, these programs are very much in demand. They're always oversubscribed. It's tough for us as a municipality to administer that on our own, but there are partners out there who can do that. Um, the Affordable Housing Trust uh, is a, 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 an arm of town government that could be funded to, to do that and work with partners in order to um, uh, 
make these programs happen. So it, it is possible depending on your budget appetite. So is, is that something that the CPA could take, like if let's say the Affordable Housing Trust looked into providing money for seniors in Great Barrington to age in place, you know, not talking about roofs or let's say they just wanted, you know, they needed their ba bathroom upgraded to a point that they could use it, um, uh, you know, if, if they become disabled or, um, you know, moving an upstairs bedroom into the first floor. And I'm just wondering, is that something that um, the CPA could move into and, and could that be under the umbrella of affordable housing that the town would um, would contribute to that in some way? Well, if if the homeowners you know, meet income qualifications, then certainly it would fit into the affordable housing umbrella. Yeah. Um, if an applicant comes to the CPA, the CPA can, can recommend funding for it. Um, and or the town can fund the trust directly mm -hmm. if you choose to do so. It yeah. doesn't have yeah. to be funded through CPA. Yeah. So I, I just like to, you know, to propose um, to, to keep that in mind and to put a note about aging in place and then having the Affordable Housing Trust look into, um, you know, creating a fund to to address this, because I do think this is an issue and um, I would like to keep seniors in their homes as long as, as possible if, if they desire that. Can we, can we advertise these things that you had said, Chris, all the things that are available? I know just so they're out there again, sometimes people need to be reminded. Sometimes people aren't even aware of what's available. I wasn't aware of some of the things you just mentioned. So um, it'd be nice if there was some way that everyone could see that and be aware of it. We, we definitely do advertise it when we have the funds to do it. It is advertised. Um, it, we, we could advertise it now or do some sort of press on it, I suppose, that may be helpful just so people know it's out there. Um, I think at the most they would maybe get a name on a waiting list since there aren't any funds to spare at the moment, but yeah, maybe at least they become a, acquainted with the program. Right. Yeah, we've done this before with other towns in cooperation, correct? That's right. Yeah, and, that, and at this point we, we don't have any funds available. So it's not right. a, We're not currently, a lot of advertising. Right, we're currently in cooperation with Agramont. Ag Town of Agramont is the lead on a three or four town program. Let's let's move ahead. Okay, next on the list is the ambulance service study and Chief Berger is gonna take this one. Okay, um, so as you all know, um, we've put a lot of work into Southern Berkshire over the past year. Um, there's mostly good news there. Um, with regards to its financial viability and operations. A lot of good changes have taken place. I believe you guys all received a letter recently from Southern Berkshire outlining those things. Um, with regards specifically to um, the ambulance service study and regionalization, that has been put on the back burner as we tried to get um, Southern Berkshire stabilized, which for any sort of regionalization effort, uh, Southern Berkshire um, needs to be the backbone of that. So with that uh, being said, and Southern Berkshire now doing better, um, staffing is still very challenging because that's very um, limited, uh, not just uh, the available EMTs and medics, both locally and nationally are uh, there's a huge shortage there. So that remains a challenge, um, even as finances are getting better. Um, but looking in some ways, uh, some regionalization efforts or regional collaboration um, can help with some of those things. Um, we were looking to get back together. Um, we do have a consultant working on this with us. We do have the funds through a United Way grant in order to continue on with the uh, consultant. And uh, we were looking to get back to that, and then uh, uh, Omicron hit, and uh, Heather, who has taken much of the lead on that, um, was once again tied up um, with COVID, so um, now we're looking to bring him back this spring at our last REP, last REPC meeting, maybe it was two meetings ago, actually. Um, we discussed uh, actually setting a date for bringing him back. 
Um, we have reached out to him, he is available. Um, so the regional discussion should be um, ongoing shortly, but with regards to more locally Southern Berkshire, um, things are a lot better there right now. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. All Thanks, good Chief. news. Moving on to Cook's Garage property. Chris is gonna take this one also. As you all know, the town took Cook's Garage uh, a few years ago for um, back taxes. Uh, we focused some brownfield cleanup, uh, brownfield assessment money there and did a hazardous building material survey. Um, searched for some uh, underground storage tanks that were suspected, thankfully weren't there anymore. Um, the next step for the, for the town is to uh, dispose of the property, develop the property. Uh, on our short list for items for town meeting is to ask town meeting approval authorization that the select board can, can dispose of the property through an RFP process. Um, the building is in pretty uh, significant disrepair at this point. Unfortunately, um, portions of the roof are uh, beginning to fail. So um, that being said, it's a, it's a fantastic location, uh, incredible views. Uh, there is the resource of, of, the, uh, of the well water, which can be used for some sort of commercial or recreational purpose. It can't be used for drinking. Um, so next step, I think uh, town meeting, and then we'll develop uh, an RFP and go from there. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Next on the list is the Houstonic Community Center, and I'll go ahead and take this one. We uh, installed uh, the internet, so we have internet access now at that location, and I expect that this will at some point soon become a a hotspot location for village um, visitors and residents because it is a, a dead zone uh, for cell service in that um, village center area. So as soon as we have some boosters installed at the front and the rear of the building, we'll put some signage up and, and, and get the word out that, uh, that that's an option for folks. The lighting inside the building uh, was replaced with efficient LED fixtures through a DOER grant, I would say back in uh, early last year. So it's, it's been quite a while now. The meeting room just to the right as you enter the front entrance of that building was cleaned out, it was painted and the meeting room furniture from town hall was relocated to that space so that once we get back into in-person meetings, which I hope is sooner rather than later, that will be another uh, option for boards and committees to meet and, and have a Housatonic presence for those meetings. And then the last item I wanted to mention on this property is the insulation, which was also funded through a DOER grant at the same time. That work has stalled at the moment because the project came in about $50,000 over bid, uh, or sorry, over budget. So uh, we'll have to rebid that at some point or uh, seek more funding through DOER. And Sean has a meeting scheduled later this week with uh, DOER, DOER representatives to find out what they're recommending we do in the situation. I, I kind of expect that a good deal of communities are having the same struggle right now. They applied for a grant based on uh, construction costs a year ago, two years ago, and, and those have dramatically changed since that time. So we just need to figure out what the next best move is for us. And that's all I have on that topic. Moving on to who's tonic fiber, Chris. Sure, thanks, Mark. We, we are uh, slowly making progress on what we call the make ready study for the uh, to see if we can extend fiber optic cable from approximately the Stockbridge Road Route 7 area northwards into Housatonic Village. Um, as you know, it's not served by fiber optic now. Um, the first step that, that we have to do to make sure that this is viable is figure out how much it would cost to string along the poles from 
the existing point of connection, which would be somewhere on Stockbridge Road, as I said, maybe around Belcher Square, maybe around the Kmart or the <laughs> what's now Marshall's and Price Chopper area, up 183 into the village. Um, so our contractor is, uh, has received the initial reports from National Grid and Verizon. They are co-owners of the poles. Uh, and they basically need to see which poles have to be replaced, uh, how much the existing lines need to be moved up and down in order to accommodate uh, additional utilities on that on that pole. So, uh, we're initial quotes were um, very high. Uh, we're trying to refine those now with Verizon and National Grid to to see. Well, maybe we need to replace this pole, but this one we don't have to. So. We're trying to bring those costs down to what might be a palatable number, either for the for a, a contractor to take it on as a private commercial venture and or uh, for the town to support the construction, the build out uh, with uh, with our own grant funds or, or other funds. So stay tuned on that. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Housatonic school is another topic that I'll take, and I won't spend a great deal of time on this one since we've talked about the school quite a bit recently. Uh, as you know, the RFP has been issued and uh, responses are due back on April 27th. The roof membrane, I think I also mentioned this recently uh, in, a, in one of our meetings, that contract has been signed and the contractor has already submitted an application for that project. So it's moving along. And you should see some work starting there uh, pretty soon. And the building at this time is secured. It's monitored by our public works department on a daily basis. It's also monitored uh, by our police department. So we're keeping an eye on it. And that's all I have on that topic. Thank you. Sean is going to uh, provide an update on infrastructure. Go ahead, Sean. You guys hear me? Yes. So I guess we'll start off with the, the sort of largest in your face project, which is the Division Street Bridge. Uh, I believe Mark has probably informed everyone that it is out to bid. And we are hoping that the project will be complete this summer, um, provided that there are no issues with procuring the, um, the bridge itself, which will be a modular one as discussed. Um, I'll give a couple other brief updates on some ongoing projects related to roads and bridges and sidewalks. Um, the Route 7 trail um, between CHP and the brewery, um, which was stalled in, in permitting with DOT, we have finally received all of the necessary permits and work is expected to start in April and finish by late April or May. Uh, Baltazar Construction has stopped work on their project, obviously with winter. Um, that project includes uh, paving work on Roster Street, Elm Court, Fairview Terrace, Benton, Brainerd, Magnolia, and Maplewood. They'll be getting back going in March um, to, to start the to finish the drainage in Roster Street and begin uh, work there. Um, the sidewalk extension in Housatonic, uh, we are at um, punch list, but there are issues with the contractor, which we are working through related to the placement of the retaining wall. I'll be keeping you guys informed as that progresses. Um, I'm meeting with them this week to hopefully identify some remedies for the issues. Uh, the slip line project in Main Street, um, the sewer line is going to commence in this month of February. It should just take a couple of days. That's Kenyon Pipe. And the Christian Hill Road uh, culvert project is anticipating that that work will begin this spring with a issue with the shutdown for winter. Um, so that's most of the projects related to bridges, roads. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other projects you wanted to question tonight, but I'm here. I have some questions, if I may. Sure. Um, I was under the uh, assumption, I guess it will be safe to say that we had been stating that the Division Street Bridge will indeed be done this summer. Now it sounds like it's an if. And no. Not going to be own that now at some point. So, provided there are no, the, the reason I said if, you no, know, only with if, is because of the incredible issues we've had um, in terms of supply chain. 
so as long as they're the, the as long as we're able to order the bridge and get it here in a timely fashion, I don't anticipate there being a, a longer uh, time frame in the summer. But things have been hectic, so that was the only reason I I put a cautionary tale in front of the uh, summertime completion. People are sensitive about the bridge, so I just wanted to clear that up. Anything else, Garfield? No. Next on the list is parking concerns. And this is something that really uh, predated our town meeting proposal to purchase and develop a lot behind our Castle Street parking lot here out behind Town Hall. And uh, this is probably something that, that can be taken off the list at some point, if you wanna discuss that later on in this meeting. We did create and uh, added 60 new spaces along the Northern Main Street stretch between the Cottage Street Bridge and the Red Bridge uh, back in the fall, you'll remember. And we're uh, still trying to encourage folks to park down there and walk into town. Uh, hoping that we'll free up 40, 60 parking spaces in the downtown area. And then the only other uh, update I can think of related to parking would be some efforts toward wayfinding here. And, and Chris, is anything that you want to share on, on that topic? Uh, well, we did just submit uh, what's called an expression of interest to uh, the Massachusetts Community One Stop Program, which is kind of a state agency clearing clearinghouse for grants. We submitted a, um, a few expressions of interest, one of which would be uh, wayfinding, another with parking management. Um, these, obviously they're on your priority list. They also came up as a result of our downtown LRRP project last, last year, the local rapid Re recovery project grant that we received. And we did some uh, polling of business owners and shop owners downtown, you know, what, what could help uh, people in the, in the downtown, uh, what could help businesses recover. Uh, parking and, and wayfinding, parking management were uh, among those results. So we're following those up. Hopefully uh, we receive a positive response from the community one stop and we're invited to submit a full application. So if we're able to, we can, we can get uh, some <clears throat> contractors on board to help us out and convene a, a process to uh, identify what sort of wayfinding should go downtown, you know, where it should be, what it should identify and things like that. So. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Mark, may I ask a question again? Yes, Mark, did you mention that we might take the parking concerns off and my other part of this question is, I'm old, um, did we not, um, Nick's, if you will, the last meeting of a $1.6 million parking uh, garage or, or area behind the, the, where the train station is now, did we not um, vote that down? You're, you're correct, Garfield. That was voted down at town meeting. That was to purchase and develop a 60 stall parking lot just beyond the Castle Street parking lot that we own and operate at this time. That's why I was suggesting that perhaps it's, it's not an issue for the town if, if that wasn't. Uh, That's why I asked, right? thank you. Yeah, that we perhaps look at other, other ways to deal with our parking. So are we saying that we'll take this off the high priority and put it to moderate or is that? We, we can decide that now or we can decide that at the end. Either way, I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's always on the list to, for me, but I'm not sure it's something that we need to leave as high priority. Steve, can I, I guess I was thinking we were going to go through them all and listen to the thing and then go back through and discuss each one. No, absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> okay. That'll take hours. So we're discussing them now. And then we will at the end, we can take off. We're not going to discuss most of the moderate ones because many of those don't have any movement whatsoever. But what we will do, we can go back, Eric, if you want to talk about some of the ones we've already talked about, uh, we can go back, that's fine. But at the end, we can either put more on the high priority, but typically what we've done, if we put something on there, we take something off. And uh, we were gonna do it at the end, you're correct, just so that we've gone through everything. 
Yeah. But if you'd like to review any of the ones we talked about, go right ahead. I guess th there's just just one um, one other one I, I did want to talk about was the Housatonic Community Center. Sure. And and just not besides the the grants for the installation, but just even you know the possibilities of more work uh, getting done there. Um, you know, more upgrades to Great Barrington's only community center. So I guess I would just like to keep that on there and 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 let it be known that, you know, looking at other revenue, uh, other alleys of investment for the Hoosie Dome. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And then Mark, with, the, with no, the parking I concerns, um, I do realize that at the last town meeting, that um, that particular proposal was voted down. Now, whether it was because people don't think we have a parking problem in town or it was the cost of it, I think is debatable. Um, there is a parking problem in the center of town. I think most of the store owners and the hey, we, everybody would say that. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with taking this off the high priority list. Uh, yeah, we got to find a different proposal, maybe. But I, I think it's, I think saying that we don't have a parking issue in downtown Great Barrington is, is just wrong. So I, there is a parking problem. Um, all the side streets, you have cars got parked up and, side, up and down each side one. Uh, maybe locals know where the secret spots are, but people coming to grab a quick coffee out of the towners, uh, Airbnb beers. We need more of a parking. Um, need more parking in the downtown area, one way or another. So I would like to keep that right where it is. Okay. Can I jump on that and just say that I think that uh, something we can do quickly and immediately is encourage. Um, downtown businesses to have their employees and to park themselves in those 60 new spots we created down past Cumbies. Uh, you know, that's immediately 60 spots that are closer to the center of town. It, it's a good idea and I think we should try. We know we failed at that many times yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should this be- throw my two cents in. I am not for leaving it on the prior high priority list. Thank you, Garfield. Let's get through the rest of them and then we'll decide if we're going to take any off and, and put any new ones on so we, we have a, a good understanding of all of them. So next on the list is Main Street, pedestrian safety and traffic. And Sean will be taking this one. So currently uh, beta engineering is working on bid documents to build the um, improvements to the crosswalks that we had discussed last year. I believe they give a presentation. Um, I think that those documents are currently in draft form, but I'll be getting something um, to you guys to look at in the next uh, three to five weeks. I, I had a brief discussion with Beta today um, so we can finalize the work that want, we want to do. We will be seeking funding for those improvements at this year's annual meeting. Um, yes. Go ahead, Lee. John, does that include include the um, the median in the middle? Right. So when I bring the draft documents before you guys, there'll probably be a couple of options for what the long term fix will be, and then you guys will have to make a decision about the path you want to take at that time. Okay. But yeah, Thank they could. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the Monument Mountain Regional High School entrance. Town and school officials met with DOT and our state representatives last summer. Uh, work was completed on the northbound lane uh, to improve visibility. Many of you have probably seen that. Uh, contractors were there to, uh, to widen that lane to allow for cars exiting the Monument Mountain high school to be able to have a, a better um, um, path to, to see oncoming traffic before deciding whether or not to enter into the um, Route 7 lanes. 
an intersection conflict system, warning system, I think is what it's called, is the next step. And that would warn drivers of potential dangers, meaning it would signal to cars that are coming into the intersection that there's a potential uh, danger ahead, meaning car entering traffic, and it would do the same for cars exiting the school. And, and I believe that MassDOT will be funding that and installing that system. Uh, I don't have a timeline exactly, but I think that's the next step. And then we'll have to talk about long-term solutions. And that's a conversation we'll have with the, uh, with everyone that was at the table at that time and with the school district. Any other questions on that topic? Um, I, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to um, our Great Barrington Police Department and to, to Stockbridge. They're doing a wonderful job directing traffic and I've received a lot of um, a positive uh, gratitude uh, in their direction. So I just wanted to, to give a shout out to both the Great Barrington Police Department and the Stockbridge Police Department. Thanks. And then Reed's Cleaners Property. Chris will take this one as well. Sure. Uh, as you know, we have a grant from US EPA for cleanup at Reed Cleaners. So as part of that grant, we we hire an environmental uh, an, an environmental engineering firm, essentially a qualified environmental professional, a QEP. Uh, we'll hire them to uh, finalize the scope of remediation. Uh, for example, dig down so far, you know, address the groundwater in this way. Um, so they'll they'll be doing some uh, refining of that scope over the next several months, probably the next four to six months, um, figuring out just what methodologies are appropriate depending on the location and types and amounts of contaminants. Um, so they'll refine that and then we'll get the cleanup project out to bid soon. I, I'm hopeful that the actual cleanup begins in calendar of 23. Um, we, don't know if we'll uh, have enough funding to complete the cleanup. It really depends on how the, um, you know, what we find when, when we're refining the scope. So meanwhile, we continue to look for other ways to get cleanup funds uh, should they be needed. And uh, so we just, we try to be proactive there. We did receive a, a market study, uh, a firm, uh, through EPA, uh, EPA has kind of a blanket contract uh, for a number of different practice areas, including some real estate professionals. And using that um, uh, assistance, these folks did a market study for us. They looked at both reed cleaners and the Carpenters variety, which is the next to the BCC building. So um, that was good. We, we have that study. It definitely shows the potential for that parcel, that reed cleaners parcel in the building to be reused and contribute either as a mixed use or a residential building to the downtown. So we're hopeful we can get the cleanup done and, and realize a project like that. Any questions? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Next on the list is short-term rental regulations. And with your permission, I'd like to skip that topic since we've covered it this evening. That's fine. Okay. So then moving on to systemic racism proclamation. This was something that I believe was added in June of last year and a proclamation was drafted and approved by this board in July of 2020. It's posted on our website uh, at this time, and you also committed at that same time to form a trust policy committee. And that's on hold at the moment after three failed attempts to get enough interest from folks to join that committee. So it's, it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's something that, that we, we won't follow through with. We just put it on, on hold for now. We did sense here from a few folks that are interested and uh, will plan to re-advertise that committee soon, probably after budget season, and, and then hope to make some progress. So we'll revisit that shortly. Moving on to trip hazards on Main Street, I'll ask Sean to cover this one. 
So the, the same engineering firm that's doing the crosswalk design has completed design for the majority of the trip hazards that designed fixes for them. It's likely that when we bid out the crosswalk improvements, we would include some of the repairs to the tripping hazards. Um, I would say that that timing of that work will have to be very specific to try to limit the impact of downtown. It probably wouldn't be something we would be doing in the middle of summer. Um, we are seeking funding uh, at this year's annual to help address some of these trip hazards as well. So we will need some funding there in order to address them. Thanks, Sean. And then moving on to water systems study, these uh, both of these studies, the uh, phase two portion, are completed at this point. They've been presented publicly to this board, and we've posted those presentations on our Lusitonic Waterworks info tab on the select board page. So anyone that missed them and would like to take a look, uh, they're they're uh, listed uh, on our website uh, with every other document related to Houstonic Waterworks. Houstonic Waterworks is um, launching a pilot program. We expect that to happen this spring uh, or summer to remove, or early summer, to remove uh, manganese that was approved by DEP back in November. And talks on next steps are happening uh, only in executive session at this time as far as what the town is uh, looking to do to uh, uh, address the long-term issue we have here. And I anticipate another meeting in executive session, probably March or uh, February. And I, the last thing I would add here is that we're also, uh, or I am also discussing what options are available to us with our legal counsel. So that's can all I have on that topic. If the board's permission, can we just change the topic left to the Sonic Waterworks? And I mean, the studies are done, but the, the problem didn't uh, go away uh, or the concerns, I won't even call it a problem. Is the board okay with that? Yeah. I am. I and also, if no one opposes, I would like just to move it to the top of the list, um, whether it's symbolic or not, but I think uh, it needs to be at our highest priority. Um, so list, like list is actually in alphabetical order, and by making it a Housatonic Waterworks, we do make it number eight. Eight. All right. All right. Alphabetical yeah, we, order. we can move it higher, though. We, we could call it action on the Housatonic Waterworks, and it'll be in alphabetical order way up top, number one. How about we put it under amazing water crisis and put that, it uh, we can put it there too. even higher? We, there Eric, I kid you. We can move it to the top. I agree with you. Thank Thank you. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention as far as high priorities go, and this is not on the list at this time, it was in June and, and uh, the situation with COVID at that time was looking better than it is at the moment. And we had moved that down to uh, completed on our list. And I, I would recommend that the board consider bringing that back to the high priority list. And Rebecca Jerzyk, our, our health agent, is here if you have any questions about the town's response, about the task force, about the efforts um, of the Board of Health and the Health Department. Yeah, I, th I think we're premature in removing it. Um, and and I, I agree that it should just go back on for the foreseeable future. Anyone disagree? No. By hearing no one will put it back on. I asked, what's that? I'm sorry, I was muted. Which item is that again, please? Uh, COVID. Uh, okay. We had taken that off and we're just should not have because a lot of effort is going into it and it should be, uh, should be on the list. It does remain a high priority for us on the staff level each and every day. So I think yeah. it, it makes sense to have that back on the priority list. Should I move into moderate priority projects? Yeah, just the ones that we are have some movement on, please. Yeah, there's only a few here, four that I'd like to cover. First one is uh, committee chairs and policies for member removal. I just wanted to mention that uh, Joe Grockmull 
many of you know, Joe, uh, you can expect to see this topic on future agendas. He's working on drafts now that include a policy for member removal. Not necessary for every board or committee right now, but it does become an issue from time to time. So we'd like to have something in place to address that. So you can uh, probably expect to see that in the next month or two. Moving on down to mission statement for the select board in town. This is another a project that Joe Grockmill is working on. The last mission statement that the board is that the board approved was a, in 2008, I believe. So we're looking to get that updated for you, and you'll have three options to discuss at your February 14th meeting, and uh, we'll have a conversation at that point. Open meeting and public records trainings for boards, and I'll ask Jen Messina to speak to this. And if you recall, back in the spring of 2020, we had these meetings, oh, sorry, these trainings scheduled in person at the senior center and had to cancel them due to COVID. So Jen, are you there? Yep. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I do believe the ones in 2020 were scheduled with the attorney general's office. Um, I just went ahead and um, reached out to Copeland and Page um, to Lauren Goldberg. She does these two trainings at the town clerk uh, conferences every year, and she does a really great job. Um, you know, she's very easy to understand. Um, you know, she, she's great all around. Um, she has stated that, yep, that she can do it. Um, she can do these via Zoom, which at this point is pretty much kind of the only option. Um, and I have reached out to her, um, Mark thought maybe like the end of March um, before we get into town meeting and election and all of that. So I reached out to her and asked if she could do March 29th and April 4th. Um, I did ask her to do them both in the evening at 6 p.m. Um, I didn't know if that, you know, if you cared about the time. Um, it might be a little harder to get her to do them during the day, as obviously she works during the day. Yeah, and I think the problem with the daytime is a lot of the board members work too. So I think this is a good idea. Okay. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. And then the last topic in the moderate priority section that I'd like to cover is the uh, URL for email addresses. Uh, I don't have any updates related to the website at this time, but I did want to just mention that. Um, our .gov domain registration application was submitted this month. So we'll be transitioning soon to uh, townofgbma.gov. So we'll be updating all of our emails and transitioning all of you over at that time. And, and Amy's taking the lead on that project. So happy to report some, some progress there. And then if I can just jump down to completed projects, I just wanted to note that since the last version you saw back in June, uh, a few items moved down here and that was, well, COVID of course, we talked about earlier and then the EV charging station, actually, sorry, let me see if I can move the list down for you. Just realized I'm not keeping up with my, there we go, there's the completed project section. EV charging station has been moved to the completed section in the front entrance to town hall. The steps, uh, that was also moved to the completed section. And you'll see that in the moderate priority project section, the elevator repairs and the front steps were all one line at one time. So I just separated that out. I left the elevator repairs in, as a moderate priority and then moved the steps to, to completed. Thank you, Mark. So board members, is there anything you want to either remove from high priority or add? Um, I, I guess Chris had been mentioned he's going to add the senior, you know, aging in place and the senior housing to affordable housing. So I don't know if that has to be a separate line item for high priority projects. Not lose sight of that. Um, I assume it can stay on the same line. Yeah, I think we can update the title for that. If we can just add senior, yeah, please, thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Garfield. 
uh, I thought possibly it could be run. Mark might have suggested maybe take the parking concerns out, put in the moderate. I know Eric doesn't agree with that. Uh, right. Lee and, and Ed. Yeah, I'd leave it where it is. I don't feel strongly either way. So whatever the um, group wants. Uh, I actually agree with Lee in this one. So I think we'll just leave it where it is. We have two who would like to leave it where it is, two who aren't too concerned and, and one who wants to take it off. So we'll just leave it. <laughs> Anything else? There's one other thing, um, and I know there's talks and everything's in the work, but um, I would like to see the Ramsdale Library and the entrance slash uh, handicap accessibility added to the list. I have no problem with that. That's in the budget proposal this year. That'll just give us more ammunition to get this approved. I agree. Thank you. Anyone else have a problem with that or won't feel strongly? It'll yeah. be added, Eric. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything on um, priority planning? Okay, let's move ahead. Um, let me just get this up. So next we are going to have citizen speak time. Perfect, thank you for, um, start with Tracy Fernbacher. You have three minutes to speak. State your name and address, please. Hello, my name is Tracy Thornton and I own a home at 21 Benton Avenue and live at Two Parley Street in Great Barrington. Um, so I wanted to speak about the short-term bylaw that's being proposed. And I want to say that I am an investor, a resident investor in this community. And I find the use of the term investor kind of batted about as a negative. And while I agree that we want to limit commercial investments in the, com in the, in the community, I think there's a difference between resident investors and commercial investors. And I feel like that really the intent of this bylaw is not to enable residents to earn extra money, but it's actually limiting residents' ability to do that and limiting their ability and flexibility to live in this community. So I'll give you my personal example. So we originally our family was living in a larger home and we would occasionally rent it out in the summer for short-term rentals. But then the pandemic hit and my husband's income came to a, a, an end. I'm a teacher in the community and we did not have any income, have not had any income for two years. However, a few years ago, we had invested in a smaller property, which we had planned to renovate to become um, a long-term rental and it was in the middle of renovations. So we moved out of our home and moved into a smaller home that was under renovation. And we were able to rent out the larger home to cover our expenses and to keep our family home. And that was, some of it was short-term, some of it was longer term. That would not have been possible with the laws that you're proposing. So I find that many on the select board, many select board, um, members speak as though they know about the, the market and how people actually use their homes in this community. And my experience in listening to you is that there's a lot of assumptions made and a lot of simplification of what's up actually happening in the market. Um, so for instance, Lee was talking about some actual numbers in supporting 90 day rental based on some numbers in San Francisco and quoted an average rate of 375 a night. I don't know where this comes from because there are, it depends on whether it's a weekend or a weekday, it depends on the season. So to look at an average number, I just don't think 
I just don't think that her, her numbers make sense. So for instance, sometimes my house will rent through 350 a night on a weeknight, but my mortgage loan is $3,500 a month. So my home could never rent for the numbers that she's talking about if we're on the market year round. The numbers just don't add up. You could, if you could just wrap up your three minutes or a little over. So if you could just wrap up, please. Yeah, that's, I, that's it. I think that that's my main point. There's a lot of talk and a lot of speculation and not a real understanding of what's happening in the market and actual data about the possible Im impacts. to Thank you very numbers. much. Tony Segala. Hi, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great, thanks. Um, obviously, you guys are probably familiar with me by now. I've been at most of these meetings since September. Um, I'm gonna try and make it brief. And my first point I'm gonna make is, why haven't you presented the tax income to the town? You guys keep talking about it. You keep saying you're gonna get it and it's not here. And as a taxpayer on multiple properties, multiple tax, tax parcels in Barrington, the fact that you're talking about creating a bylaw and not knowing what it's gonna to do to the taxpayers' pockets is insanity to me. And I'm sorry, but it's, 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 it's crazy. Where are the numbers? How much is the town making? How much are they gonna lose? What's it gonna be after this is put through? It's, it's, it's crazy to me and um, I'm sorry, it's just, we spend a lot of money in tax in this town, a lot. And what is this gonna to do to it? What is it actually going to do to the town uh, when it comes to tax money? Uh, secondly, <clears throat> um, you guys keep talking about zero uh, vacancy rate in Great Barrington. I'm one person and I know of three available apartments in Great Barrington right now. It's completely available long-term. So to throw around zero, 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 it's, it's just incorrect. It's bad information. People don't advertise in the shopper's guide because they don't have to. Everything's word of mouth. It's just the way things go. Um, thirdly, I think you're underestimating the impact on local businesses here uh, with the short-term bylaw. I, I really do, you know, it, do, do locals shop in town? Yes. Do they, do they produce the same amount of money that the second homeowners do? Absolutely not. It just absolutely not. And, and I'll give you a great example. I was walking down Main Street the other day with my fiance. She saw this beautiful plate in the window. One plate, $200. I'd like for anyone on this board right now to raise their hand and say they'll buy a plate for $200. Please. I, I, just, I just don't see it. And, and bravo to that shop if they can sell that plate to a second homeowner or anybody for that matter. But I know it's not me. I know it's probably 90% 90, 90 of the community. Um, lastly, in regards to the, to the 90 day minimum, uh, I don't think this is going to achieve what you're thinking of. Um, at the end of the day, people are just going to do 30 day rent, 31 day rentals, and it's not going to open up housing stock. I'm sorry. It just, it just isn't. Um, it's not going to, what, it, what it's going to do is going to take away the opportunity to collect the 6% plus the community impact fee, which you could put on top of it, which is an additional 3%. Um, and that's just gonna go right out the window, tax revenue to the town, because the 31 day you can't collect on it and uh, you're gonna lose a lot of money. Um, you're, Barrington you're, will become a 30, a 30 day minimum town and that's just what it's gonna be for a lot of these places. So a lot of, lot of interesting points, um, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I just say something? No, we're still having okay. citizens speak. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia Shapiro. Just unmute yourself, Claudia. Claudia, if you just can unmute yourself, you may be having problems, but... If not, I'll go back to you. I won't. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one, Mark. If you just take her off, and I'll I'll bring her back when she can unmute herself. 
Um, Leo Stemp. Yeah, go ahead. You're unmuted. Okay, Mark, let's do the same thing there. And we'll go back to Mr. Stump. Uh, James. This doesn't Thank work. Then. For... Oh, it's work. Good. Go ahead. Thank you for giving me a, a couple of minutes. I'll just make this brief. Uh, yeah, name, or... name and address, please. Yes, sorry. James Garzone, 84 North Plain Road. Thank you. Uh, the first item, if possible, could we put a left turning lane into the town recycling center? I know it's only open three days a week, but when I'm driving north to make the left, people aren't happy behind me and people aren't happy going south because they don't understand what I'm trying to do. Number one. Uh, number two, uh, I don't know if this is possible, but I feel that we have enough dispensaries in Great Barracks that I think would be oversaturated by them. And I don't know if we can put a restriction. And we're trying to put a restriction on short term rentals. Perhaps we can do the same thing for dispensaries. Uh, three, I do agree we have a parking problem in the center of town. So that kind of contradicts that, you know, we trying to eliminate the short-term rentals for people coming to town but if we eliminate short-term short, short -term rentals for people who are tourists and spending all this money in our businesses if they can't stay locally within the town then they have to drive which is causing more of a traffic parking problem and i also feel that it's a little disingenuous with someone in new york coming and saying that they have 20 cases of people being evicted from their properties now and they can't find a place which I don't know if that's true or not, but as to somebody else's point, one, we need the numbers to back up what are we going to lose in revenue, how much are we going to generate, and we need actual numbers of the town, you know, 335 per night average, you know, it's just, these numbers aren't making sense. We're not Stockbridge, we're not Lennox, we're not San Francisco. So I just want to say thank you for all the hard work you're doing, and again, I support what everyone is, is trying to accomplish, and Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'll just give you two factual answers. The left turn lane would be a state issue because it's a state highway. We couldn't do that. And the dispensary, the town meeting um, a number of years ago turned down the limit and we haven't proposed it again. So that's just where we are right now. Okay, moving ahead to Dan Ruderman. Thank you, uh, Dan Ruderman for Knob Hill Road. And I wanted to just um, just publicly for the record, start off by saying I do support very strongly the work that Lee Davis is doing. And I have no vested interest in the topic on either side. I'm not a real estate agent that makes more money if more houses are sold for higher dollars, um, which may be the profession that many of the other people are speaking of. I think what's great about the bylaw that's been proposed is that it's stated a good purpose and intention to maintain the community without being onerous on anybody. I think that the, uh, if people, if you read it, it says I, I could, for example, rent my house out for the whole summer to one group or one person, and then still have 90 more days that I could do for short-term rentals. So I could get every single weekend and the ski season in and be in compliance with it. So I think it's extremely reasonable, but it does discourage people from turning houses in neighborhoods into hotels that aren't regulated as it. And from a zoning perspective, I think that that means that it can apply to the hotel in a single zone because we do have zoning for hotels, inns, and bread and breakfast. And in fact, people are instead using homes as Airbnbs with over 90 nights, that is a hotel, but we're not regulating as it's such and it's happening in a, in a zone that it's not supposed to. So I think that um, I wanna say that I support the work that Lee is doing. It's, it's, um, she's put a lot of effort into it. I don't think we need to know all the numbers. I still can't figure out how electricity works, but every time I flip the switch, the lights come on in my house. Eric, thank you, you put some in in my garage for me. 
Um, so, you know, I don't need to know all the data, but I've also seen the data that Lee has pulled up and it's pretty accurate. She's using public sites. And I'm not sure why everybody says I need to see data. And then somebody says, here's a letter from a lawyer that says he knows 20 people evicted for this reason. And then people on the board say, oh, I'm not going to take that data. That's just a letter from a lawyer. So it, it's kind of contradictory. And I have to say the board's been extremely cooperative with each other on going through the priorities. But on the conversation about short-term rentals, there seems to be a little bit of a passive aggressiveness or hostility. And I'm not sure if we've surfaced what the reasons are for that. And I would love to see the board explore that further. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Gabrielle Sunza. Hi, thank you. Gabrielle Sanza from Knob Hill. Um, and my studio is down here in Great Barrington on Railroad Street. So yes, I've spoken a number of times at these meetings and I really appreciate the perseverance and the due diligence, especially on Lee's part. I, it really frustrates me as I can imagine it would frustrate anybody, especially one who's putting so much effort into doing the research to hear people say, give me more data, give me more data, give me more data. And then also anytime there's like this effort to very considerately and carefully go through line by line as you guys were doing tonight to constantly get this battering ram response like that's so frustrating and maddening and so i'm just observing what's been happening and it's really challenging um and, and, and I think uh, it's been pointed out and I'm going to point it out again. Why are you not considering, Ed, the true stories that people are telling us? Why are you saying over just, and over? Just address, Gabrielle, if you could just address this to the chair, please. So to the board and anyone yeah, else? to the board and yes, yes. please. Um, that, that there are people losing their homes due to all different reasons, not exclusively to short-term rentals, but definitely including short-term rentals. And we've been seeing responses to posts on, on uh, Facebook discussions as well, trying to lead conversations that are productive. Um, so I really, really uh, support Lee's choice. No one's gonna be 100% happy with this, but we do need to do something in order for, for staff to continue working in our businesses here for people to have places to come to to shop because people are gonna to come to Great Barrington from all over. It doesn't matter whether they're living in town or staying in town or whatever, they're gonna come. Um, and, and we want the restaurants to be able to be able to be open and they cannot stay open enough if they do not have staff that can afford to live here. So please, I just wanna resurface those, per, those concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you. Justin Henderson. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Justin Henderson. I own a home at 145 Hurlburt Road. And I do not live permanently in town, but I do visit um, whenever I can. My wife's family bought that town. I bought that house about 35 years ago. And now my wife and I own it. So we've been a part of that community for several decades. Um, and I still am questioning this intentional division of these labelings of investor versus non-investor when people are trying to supplement their incomes by renting houses out. Number one, the, and that's, so number two, the request for one data point of tax earned per year is not an unreasonable ask. And that's not asking for more data. That's the only data anyone's been asking for since it started. And it's been failed to be proffered at this point. So you still don't even know what's, what's at risk here. Secondly, the data of what an estimated economic impact would be of a loss of business from contractors, restaurants, and shop owners is like the second most crucial data point. Still no, nothing but conjecture on that. Instead, we just have these anecdotal letters of, from people third. So hearsay, essentially, you're telling me that a lawyer saying he knows 20 people is data. That's, that's, I'm incredulous that people are even saying that that's data, that's an anecdote. Um, thirdly, um, 
I I still think that um, this this is being it's it's fan it's fantasy that limiting homes that are going to be two three million dollar sales and calling them affordable housing is going to help affordable housing. Like my mine is one of the properties written up in the Eagle, and there's just there's no way affordable housing and my property should be uttered in the same sentence. So this just seems like some kind of strange attempt to depress home values in Great Parrington with some fantasy that that's going to make a bunch of more housing available for workers. Well, the reality is, is there won't be jobs for workers when you crush the economic benefit of tourism. And there isn't a lot of places to stay. It needs short-term rentals. Great Barrington needs short-term rentals in order to attract tourists. Or they will not be venturing into GB. They'll be in Stockbridge and Lennox. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Let's try again for uh, Claudia Shapiro. Except I think I did CTSB. But Mark, you can remove them. And Claudia, you can unmute yourself and speak. One more try, Claudia, please. Okay. Mark, if you remove Claudia, and I'm going to try one more time at Leo Stemp. Go ahead, Mr. Stemp. Mr. Stemp. How, how's that? Can you hear me there? But much better. Much better. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to just be very brief and direct. You know, everybody appreciates having Lee Davis on you know, sort of running this show here, given that that's her, that's her expertise. But I do believe that, you know, a lot of things she's saying is she's saying she's giving a lot of her opinion with very little data. And she's um, sort of overpowering most everybody else, what, what's being said on the board. Just, in just any event, the entire just board, just the entire board, please. Sure. In any event, it's, it's, it's clear that the meat of this proposal is the 90 day limit on short term rentals. There's no real, there's nothing else in the proposal is really arguable. That's number one. The second thing is that what Lennox did is their business. And I don't see what, what uh, relevance that has to what's going on in Great Barrington, especially given that, as Ms. Davis said, what they did in Lennox is tied into Tanglewood, which is a unique situation that's applicable only to them. Uh, for that matter, what about the Stockbridge ordinance? The Stockbridge ordinance has no limit on their short-term rentals. Um, you know, the the bottom line is that most of the short-term, most of the homes that are used for short-term rentals, were they not to be used for short-term rentals, they are not suitable for they would not be converted into what you're aiming at, which is affordable housing. And Ed Abraham brought up the point that there's a cost to the town for limiting short-term rentals. As uh, Justin Henderson was just saying, there's gonna be a loss in tourism and that's gonna be a big hit to both the tax revenue and the, and the business owners. Um, I, I agree with everybody who's talking about the data. We need a lot more data. And I'll, I'll end with that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Stump. Okay, let's start with, um, last is Nan Weil. Nan, just unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I was having trouble with my mouse. Um, right. Okay. So, so I don't want to trip over myself here because there've been a lot of things that I felt were wrongly stated. First of all, these, the short term rental regulations is not supposed to take care of the housing shortage. The housing shortage is a much more complex, multifaceted problem. Short term rentals will not cure it. However, a regulation on short term rentals may preserve some of the existing housing that is being repurposed currently and turned into short term rentals, which then gobbles up 
apartments that were at one point, maybe just weeks ago, available to long-term residents who pay taxes, work here, and have raised their families here. You can talk about uh, numbers <clears throat> all you want. I would like you people, all of you, I'm not pointing out every, any single one of you on the board, but I would like you to remember you have been pointed and elected by us to take care of our best interests. That does not mean to um, uh, conflagrate a, a numbers or figures or something like that as convenience in an argument. What we're really talking about here is taking care of our neighborhoods, our citizens, taking care of the safety of our neighborhoods. If you have people who are checking in and out of a household and you have your kids walking down the street all the time and you don't know who's in that household or what cars are there, it's, it's unnerving. It's not a comfortable situation. We are not saying to people that live here or be not we, but the, the um, proposed regulations do not say that people that have, live here full time are going to be restricted in the amount of short-term rentals they do, which they need to uh, maximize in order to afford their mortgages and support their income uh, at all. Those people are supported in what I saw in this version of the, of the proposed bylaw. Anyway, let's get, our, let's get our reasoning straight and our priorities straight. Let's you guys please focus on the good of the individual community members who voted you into office and who are counting on you to take care of them, them and work in their best interest. That's it, that's all I have to say. And thank you all for doing all of your hard work. I'm full of admiration for every one of you. Well, thank you, Nan. Not... Thank you, Nan. Okay, Garfield, go right ahead now. Just unmute yourself, please. The people that, first of all, um, I'm gonna speak from my own experience in, in, in vacation. I've never looked for uh, short-term rentals, never kept me from going to a town where I wanted to visit and stay. Another thing is I think the people that are concerned about what the revenue is gonna be lost, they don't have those figures either. So you have to come up with the figures that you think we're going to lose money on. I personally don't feel that way. I think we're a four season town. I don't think we're gonna lose a lot of business that way. And the people, if they're going to not stay in Great Barrington, they're gonna stay in Stockbridge, they're gonna stay in Monterey. All these places have nowhere to shop, but they're going to come to Great Barrington regardless. So the people that are uh, expounding how much money we're going to lose, you tell me how much it is, and then I'll be concerned and worried about if it's a lot. But you don't know that either. So you can't make that conjecture either. So I, I have a problem with that. Thank you, Garfield. Eric? I'm all set, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Ed? Nothing, thanks. Lee? Nothing, thank you. And I have nothing. So media time. Seeing no one in the media raising their hand. Give them another second. By unanimous consent, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.